Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section introduction. So in the last section, we covered how to alter the flow of our programs to get them to repeat a block of code. In this section, we will see how to get our programs make decisions. We can execute different blocks of code depending on some conditions. JavaScript provides the if else statement and also something called a switch statement. When you have completed this section, you will understand how to use them and when should you use which one. There is also something called as a ternary operator. If that sounds complicated, don't worry, it's not. It is just a more concise way of coding if else when you want to assign a value to a variable. We will see how to use it at the end of this section. So that's what we are going to cover in this section guys. I'm very excited. I'll see you inside. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about if statement in JavaScript. And by the end of this lecture, you will have an understanding as to what are if statements and how can you use it in your projects. So we have seen some if statements in the two sample projects, Eliza and Hammer Bitcoin. Now it's time to examine them in more detail to understand how to use them. I'm going to start with a simple example and we'll expand it to cover else statement as well. So what I'm going to do is I am going to create a new folder over here. Okay. So this new folder and this folder will be called as let's say rock paper scissors here I'll just get this template files like index.html and main.js so I'll just paste it over here okay and I'll just close this I'll close in fact everything close others and I'll have index.html here okay fair enough and main.js so main.js right now has some javascript code which i'll clear out and i'll hit save so we have done the setup okay i have an empty js file here and an html file which links to the js and these two reside in rock paper scissor folder so i'll collapse this now what we are going to do is we are going to build a game called rock paper and scissors okay and you can find a description of this game on wikipedia so this is the wikipedia article where you can read more about the game so i won't go through the instructions this game originated in china and has spread throughout most of the world in one form or another and that's why we chose it okay so we have some basic setting up to do, okay? And I'll link this URL into the resources section of this lecture, okay? So we'll head over to our IDE now. So here in the IDE, we have some basic setting up things to do, okay? And it's mainly the stuff that we have seen before and you don't want to watch me typing it in. So what I will do is I have a notepad open here and I have already written some code over here. And the code is available to download and copy along with this lecture. So just look out for some resources. I'll just copy this for now and I'll paste it in the JavaScript file. All right, I'll just zoom out a bit so that we can see everything. Now here you can see the source code and you can see 
the computer is going to choose its play at random using the random function that we have seen before. Uh, so this is a random method from math class that we have seen before. It will generate a random number either 0, 1 or 2 to represent rock, paper or scissors. We can see that over here. Okay. Now at the top we have some constants defined here. So we are using the const keyword and a usual convention to define constant and we are using the usual convention which is defining the constant all in caps okay which is uppercase now they are the same as normal declaration with the word const this is short for constant that tells javascript that the value can't be changed Throughout the program, rock will always be zero, paper will always be one, and scissors will always be two. Using constants like this makes our code easier to read. We don't have to remember that paper is two. We can work with the names that we recognize. We have two variables declared, which is player choice and player value here. So player choice is just declared and player value is set to minus one. So if they enter rock, we'll set the player value to zero. If they enter paper, we'll set the player value to one and so on. Okay. And right now the value is a minus one. Okay. And that is what the player value will be if the player enters something else. They may type uh, any string, armadillo, for example. Okay, we are going to delete that later, but it's the need at the moment, or the code won't work. Okay, so now what we'll be wanting is we'll be wanting to accept input or a value from the user. For that, we'll be using the prompt function, and this is a function that will show a pop up in the browser and will allow the user to type in a value. Okay. So let me show you how prompt works. And for that, I'll just open this file with the live server. Okay. So we have live server up and running and I'll switch over to console for a while here. Now here I'll start making use of prompt. So I'll say console dot log I'll say prompt okay and I'll put a semicolon now this will open up a prompt in the browser and let me show it to you so I'll hit save and you can see a prompt over here okay now if I type hi and if I say okay you will see hi being printed on the console because we are printing the output of the prompt function onto the console. So prompt just shows a prompt in the browser. It's something similar to an alert box, but with an input field. All right. And it can be used to accept inputs. Now you can also have a message over here. So you can say it, please enter rock paper or scissors all right and you can hit save and you will see a message appear over here so i can just enter the value i can say rock okay and you can see i entered rock because that is what is being printed via console.log okay you can even add a function over here so i can say dot to lowercase or let me show you without adding the function so if i type it in caps if i say rock in caps you will see rock in caps being printed but i don't want all in caps so every time irrespective of what user types in i want everything in the lowercase uh, i'll use two lowercase over here along with the prompt and i'll hit save 
you will see prompt again so i can say rock enter and you can see everything is now converted to lowercase because of two lowercase over here so this is a short introduction to prompt you can say okay so what we'll be doing is we'll be using prompt to ask user his selection from rock paper or scissors okay and we'll keep this parameter passed in because we want to show the user a message as to what he or she is supposed to select so what i will do is i will assign this i'll remove this console.log and i'll assign this to player so i'll i'll say player choice here right so and i'll just remove this bracket from here all right so now we have the player choice over here in the player choice variable all right and whatever user enters in the prompt will come to the player choice variable now let me make use of the if statement and let's see how it works so i'll say if and within if i'll say player choice is equal to rock then player value is equal to rock so rock is assigned as zero over here player value right now is minus one initially but then we assign it with the value rock because user has entered rock and whether user has entered rock or not we are checking it over here okay so what we are actually doing is we are testing using the if statement to see if the player has typed in rock okay and we set the player value to zero which is nothing but the value that we have assigned to the rock constant okay and we have used the rock constant instead of directly using zero because rock is easier to remember and we can do the same for paper and scissors we can but we shouldn't and i'll come back to that in the next video and i'll explain why we shouldn't but as it is a question that student often ask i'm going to do it this way to start it with okay so i'll just say over here if or rather i'll just copy this yeah it will save some typing typing efforts for us so i'll copy paste and i'll say paper and here also i'll select paper i'll paste here and i'll say scissors and i'll select scissors yeah so that's more just of same like we did for rock okay so on this line line number 18 we are checking if the user has entered paper and then we check for scissors as well all right and depending on what user has entered if this condition is true then we change the player value accordingly as to what user has given as an input okay so the syntax for if statement is we start with an if keyword followed by the condition in parenthesis okay and here we are using equals sign two times to compare strings okay and if the player choice is scissor over here then this is evaluated to true otherwise it returns false and we then go so we start with rock and then we go on to check for paper and scissors as well so you may spot why we shouldn't do it this way by now if not don't worry all will come back to clear in the next video okay i am going to finish the game in this video but it would be good to see this code working okay we can print out the two variables and run it to check okay so what i will be doing is i'll be using the alert function so i'll say alert okay and i'll say player choose
play a choice okay and i'll add a comma the value is dollar and i'll say play a value now i'll hit save so it will reload in browser it will say please enter rock paper or scissor so i'll say rock and the player choose rock the value is zero which is perfect okay you can run it a few times okay and see if you get the correct values for rock paper and scissors okay also check that we get minus one if you enter something else and if you wondered why i stressed the word else there you will find that out in the later upcoming videos so i'll leave you to set a few breakpoints as well so you can set breakpoints here on the if condition and you can see the program running and step through the code to see what's happening okay so you can set the breakpoint here in the browser and debug the code all right so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how if statements work in javascript so that's about this class i'll see you guys in the next class thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk about the else statement in javascript in our previous video we have got our program to map the player's choice to a number the computer will generate its own random number here for the computer's choice that you can see and we can't compare integers to strings and that's why we had to get the player value as an integer so what we did is we accepted string from the user and we converted that into the corresponding integer we have used a series of if statements it works but it's not very efficient if you have used debugger to step through the code you would have noticed that every if condition is being tested even if the player enters rock the other two if conditions here are also being tested and that's obviously redundant because we have already identified that the user has typed rock so we should not execute or we should not test the other two if conditions so what we want is for subsequent test to be ignored if one has already passed okay because player will be entering any one of these three values all right so now let's see that working with rock and paper test so here we have these two tests okay and what i will be doing is i will be changing the second condition here to else so i'll say else if here now with this change the condition for paper here is only evaluated if player choice isn't rock okay now we are still testing for scissors also even though if we have already found rock or paper but fixing that is more of the same okay so i'll just add else over here done so you can keep going with as many else clauses as you need generally though you should use something called as a switch statement once you get above about three conditions we will look at switch statements a bit later on okay so this code caters for three valid choices rock paper and scissors now if player enters something other than rock paper or scissors we can use a final else clause to let them know that their choice wasn't valid so what i will do is i'll enter else over here i'll say else and i'll add a block here
and I'll add an alert statement. I'll say dollar player choice is not a valid choice. I'll end this with a semicolon. So now we have three conditions, three or four conditions here. First is if, then we have else if, else if and another else condition. So I'll leave you to step through this code to verify that it doesn't test any more conditions than it needs to, okay? So if I hit save, you will see a similar working here. So if I say rock, you will see player choose rock, the value is zero. And if I say RRR, it says it's not a valid choice. So it's definitely working, okay? And we have two pop-ups here, okay? If there is an incorrect choice, so this one and this one, which is fine for now. But our program works, okay? You can step through the code and just try to understand how many times which condition is being evaluated and how these if else statements are being evaluated. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity of else statement and how can you use it in your programs. So that's about this class. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to write some more if else conditions in our rock, paper, scissor game. So our program now lets the player make the choice and also generates a random number for the computer's choice. The next step is to work out who has exactly one. So a draw is easy. For example, if the computer value is equal to the player value, then it's a draw. A win is almost as easy to check, except that the sequence is cyclical. Looking at the constants over here defined, paper is one greater than rock, scissor is one greater than paper. So since paper is one greater than rock, paper beats the rock and scissors beat the paper. We get a problem with rock beating scissors though because rock has value zero and we really need it to be zero sometimes and three at other times. That's obviously not possible unless you are using a quantum computer. So we'll start off with a slightly complex condition. First, a draw, that's easy. So I'll scroll down, okay? And uh, I'll say over here, I'll just comment this. And I'll say over here if player value is equal to computer value, okay? Then we say alert, it's a draw. Or instead of alert, you can even use console.log. So I'll just use console.log. Okay, I don't want to create uh, more alert boxes. So this is a condition for the draw, which is pretty clear and pretty easy. So if it's not a draw, we have to decide who won. And as I said, the condition is complicated by rock beating scissors, even though it's got a lower value. So what we'll be doing is I'll say, I'll press enter, I'll say else if, and I'll add a condition here. I'll say player value minus one is equal to computer value. Enter and I'll, I'll say or player value is equal to rock and computer value is equal to 
scissors. Then we say console.log player wins. Okay, so I'll just expand this a bit so that we can see it clearly. So I've split the condition across two lines over here. So this if condition is split across two lines as you can see because it was getting a bit long. Okay, and I'll just take it here. Fair enough. Yeah. So the first part is easy wherein we are checking if player value minus one is equal to computer value. Okay, then this condition will be evaluated to either true or false. Okay, and this entire thing is part of a single condition within the if statement. All right. So the first part is easy. I said the player wins if the their value is greater than one than the computer's value. That means the player wins if player value minus one equals the computer value. And that's what we are checking over here. Okay. We also need to check for rock beating scissors. And that is the condition here that we are doing. And as you can see, we can make these conditions as complex as we need. So within the if statement, we have two condition. So this is condition number one and the condition number two. And we are using or operator here. So this is the or operator to allow the first two conditions. The second condition is also a compound condition, which is using and over here. So this is the and operator to only allow rock to win when the computer chooses scissors. Now that we have dealt with a draw and the conditions that and the conditions when the player wins, any other outcome means that the computer has won. All right. So what I can do is I can simply write an else condition over here. I can say else console dot log compute the computer wins. Okay. So there's a much easier way to work out who's won. And we'll look at that when we see the modulus operator in the later sections. For now, I'll leave you to run the program a few times to make sure it works. And if you're thinking, but how do we know? We can't tell what the computer chose. All right, then go to the top of the code. All right, so you'll get an opportunity to fix this in the upcoming lecture. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we added a few more if else conditions over here to decide who has won. And that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to develop this program further and we will also discuss a challenge by the end of this lecture. So let's get started. Our program appears to be working, but we can't tell for sure unless we know what the computer chose. We can't verify that our conditions are correct. What would be good is to print out the player and computer choices and for that, I will have to declare a new variable. Okay. So if we print out player and computer choices, it will be clear what computer has chosen as well. So I'll just collapse this and I'll scroll up. I'll need to declare a variable. So I'll say here at computer choice. All right. So this is computer choice. And I'll scroll down. We can even print a computer choice now. So here, instead of alert, I'll just uncomment and I'll change this to console.log. So we'll use console log, okay, to print the output. I don't wish to create uh, more pop-ups. So I'll say player choose player choice, okay. And I'll say computer choose. So here I'll add Okay, computer choose dollar.
computer choice all right and i'll even remove this value here okay we don't need it and i'll hit save now let us try this program so i'll say rock over here i'll say okay player choose rock the value is zero okay one second so it didn't come on the console probably something wrong all right something wrong with my local host so i'll just hit this go live button okay so the program has reloaded i'll say rock enter so you can see computer chose undefined player chose rock and player wins okay player wins is good but what did computer choose that i don't know so right now we are getting undefined printed okay this works perfectly fine except this one problem okay so right now we are seeing undefined being printed okay and we only have the numeric value for computer and not the choice as a string at the moment computer choice doesn't have a value and that's why we got undefined printed in the code that i've just typed in we could print the number but that won't look very good right so we have the computer choice here sorry computer value here but i even need a choice and we need to derive the string so whether the computer has chosen rock paper or scissor from this value that we are getting okay now a much more efficient way to do all this would be to use a dictionary we'll come back to this problem or this program when we look at dictionaries in the later sections of this course as this section is about if else we'll be practicing them in the challenge so the challenge code will go over here okay so i'll just type in so the code for your solution goes below this comment all right so the code for your solution will have to go below this comment okay and now the challenge is we have to use if else to give computer choice the correct string for the number chosen by the computer if the computer chooses 0 for example then the computer choice should have the value rock and the same for paper like one will be paper and two will be scissors so i'll go over my solution in the upcoming video so that's about this class guys in this lecture we added computer choice variable into our program so that we could store the string representation of the computer choice so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the solution to the challenge that we discussed in our last videos. So if you scroll down, the solution to the challenge is very similar to this code that we have here. So this code that I've highlighted here, okay? Or let me highlight it from here. So this entire highlight here. So the solution to this challenge is exactly, or I should say very similar to these lines of code, okay? So these lines worked out numbers from the strings. So here you had strings in player choice and you worked out numbers from them. But here we need to work out strings from the numbers. So it's the reverse. So what we will do is we will start writing our code and I'll just copy this. Okay, so that we could save a bit on the typing effort. So I just pasted it here and we can say if computer value is equal to 
So instead of string, I'll compare number because we have number here. And here I'll add a string to the computer choice. Okay. So I'll say computer choice. There you go. I'll copy this again and I'll paste it over here. If computer value is equal to paper, then computer choice is equal to paper. I'll copy this as well. If computer value is equal to, okay, we don't need a third one. So third, third time we don't need else if, so I'll just delete this. So if there is no match for these two, then obviously the value is scissor, right? So it's done. So we have successfully converted the numbers to the string representations, right? It's a bit shorter code than the other one because the computer won't make an invalid choice. That means we don't need to test explicitly for scissors and hence we have directly mentioned that in the else block. If the computer choice isn't rock or paper, then it has to be scissors. Now I would request you to run through the program. So I'll just save this and here I'll say rock. I'll press. Okay. It reloaded for some reason. So I said rock. So you, you, you can see that player choose rock and computer choose scissor. So player wins. Fair enough. Now, this is definitely an improvement and we can verify that our code is now making the right decisions. The program can be improved further though. It's a bit tedious to have it to run each time, right? What would be good is to ask the player if they want to play a game. We have seen how we can use while loop and do while loops. And this is a great opportunity to use one of them. It's also great to practice at modifying a longer bit of code. So just when you thought you could relax, we'll have another challenge. And it's not hard as it sounds because we are going to add a function get yes or no. Okay. And I have the function ready over here written and you will find this as an attachment to this lecture. So you can just download the source code, copy it and you can scroll down here and you can paste it over here in the end. So now we have got get yes or no function and this function is available for our use. Okay. And we'll use it in the challenge. So the challenge is to use a while or a do while loop to play the game repeatedly until the player wants to stop. The program should ask the player if they want to play again. If they answer by pressing N, then the program should terminate. If they press Y, the program should loop and ask them to choose rock, paper or scissors again. It's up to you whether you use while or a do while loop, but one of them is more appropriate than other. You may want to review the videos in the previous section. It's completely fine. Okay. But I'll go over my solution in the upcoming video. So that's about this class guys. So in this lecture, we discussed the solution to the challenge that we had in one of our last lectures. And we even have one more challenge now, which is to use get yes or no function. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the solution to the play again challenge. So how did you get on? Did you manage to find the solution or work on a solution for this? If not, no worries. We will just take a look at the solution. So there's a quite a lot of code in this program now and working with larger program files is a great experience. I'll go through my solution 
and I'm going to use a do while loop. And the reason for that decision is that the game will always be played at least once. That means there is no need to check until the end of the loop. Remember that a while loop tests its condition at the start, whereas do while tests it at the end. Now there's nothing wrong with using a while loop if you prefer. What's important is that your change works. If you have done it differently to my solution, that's perfectly fine. As long as the game repeats until the player quits and the computer makes a different choice each time, then you have completed this challenge. All right, coming back to my solution. So uh, in my coding editor, I'll scroll up, all right. And here, just before I write about random numbers, so I'll start with a do while loop over here. And now next we need the while part of the do while loop. Unless we add that, we'll get an error. So if you scroll down, you will see we are getting an error here. All right. So we have got a method or a function called get yes or no that returns true if the player wants to play again and false if they don't. That makes the while condition very easy. We just call this function and give it the question that we want to ask the player. So what I will be doing is I will be just ending the loop over here. Okay, because after that we have the function. So I'll say while I'll say get yes or no. And here I'll say, so as you can see, this function accepts one parameter, which is nothing but the question. So the question can be, would you like to play again? All right. And as I said, it's not important that you have got exactly the same code as me. You may have decided to use a Boolean variable to store the result from get yes or no. And that's fine. And I wouldn't say that one way or the other is better. I wanted to show you that you can include the method call directly in the condition. But if you used a Boolean variable, that's great. Okay, the real test is does it work? So what I will do is we should run the program. Okay. And it should keep playing as long as the player answers why. Okay, so I'll say save. Okay. And I'll just refresh this. So it asks me like enter rock, paper or scissors. I'll say rock. Okay. And it's a draw because computer also chose rock. As you can see on the console, it's a draw. Now it's asking me, would you like to play again? I say yes. Why? And it's again asking me enter rock, paper or scissor. This time I say paper and you can see player wins. Okay. So it's asking me, would you like to play again? I say N and the game stops. So if you notice, we tested this for Y, N. Okay. And if you enter any other key, so let me test this for any other key as well. Okay. So I say rock. So it's asking, would you like to play again? I say S. Now this is not Y, neither N. So it again asks me, would you like to play again? Would you like to play again? So it's not allowing me to go further unless and until I enter Y or N. All right. Now pressing N will just terminate like we know. Now, now the important part over here is that your solution should work. Okay. It does not matter if your code is a little bit different from that of mine. That's perfectly fine. There may be different ways of achieving same things when you do programming. All right. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we went through the solution for get yes or no challenge, wherein we 
allowed user to play game again and again with the help of get yes or no function. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to be introduced to a new type of statement called the switch statement. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what is a switch statement and how can we write switch statements and use them in our programs. So let's get started. So when we were looking at if else statements, I mentioned that there was another way to write code. And that other way was something called a switch statement. So what we will be doing is we will switch over to our simple menu project. So I'll close all of this now. I'll go to the simple menu project here. So this one, I'll open main.js. All right. And we will recreate this project over here. Okay. So what we will do is we will have six options to test. Okay. So let me just run this file and let me see. Okay. So I'll just right click. I'll say open with live server. All right. So we have six options to test over here. Okay. On the HTML. Okay. Which is fine. But what we will do is we will create something, some console based things as well. All right. So I'll just clear this out for now. Okay. So this is the menu function, which we are referring to index.html as well. So, or I'll keep this menu function if needed because we are referring it into the HTML. Okay. So what I will do is I'll go over here. All right. I'll just press enter a few times here. Okay. And I'll start writing some code over here. All right. So I'll first create a variable called question. Okay. And I'll say, please choose one of the following options. All right. I'll just make this full screen for a while now. Okay. And I'll just put in slash n over here. Okay. Now here I'll say first option is cappuccino. Okay. Then we have slash n. I'll just copy this character here. So slash n means new line. Okay. So what it tells is after the string is printed, I want a new line character to be printed. All right. So one cappuccino, two latte, a new line again, I'll say three Americano, new line again, or instead of new line, I'll say plus. And here on the next line, I'll have new line, I'll say four mocha. Okay, new line again. I'll say five macchiato. Okay, then new line again, and I'll say six espresso. Slash in again, and I'll say Q, quit the program. All right. So we have this variable over here now. Now, what I will do is I'll write a do while loop. I'll say do. Okay. And I'll say user choice is equal to prompt. So I'll pass this question over here. Okay. So this is a question string that we have created. Okay. Please choose one of the following options. And I'm passing this question into the prompt function. And whatever response I get, I want to convert that to lowercase. So I'll say to lowercase like so. And then here I'll print on, so I'll log on console. I'll say, okay, I'll say you 
choose dollar user choice and here I'll end the do while loop so I'll say while and I'll add a condition I'll say while user choice equal to Q okay so far so good okay I'll just move this function out of the screen okay so let me explain what I did okay so what we have done is we have created a question string over here and a do while loop over here so this do while loop runs until the user choice is e not equal to Q okay so here we are checking if user choice is equal to Q and then we are negating that all right so if user choice is equal to Q this became this becomes true okay and we then convert it to false okay and then we have this use of prompt function wherein we are passing question and we are converting that to lowercase and we are just printing this on the console okay so far so good so if we were writing the code to control a real vending machine our code would get the machine to perform a series of steps for each coffee type right we haven't got any hardware really to make a coffee so what we will do is we will just print out the steps which will simulate the behavior of making and dispensing a coffee so the first thing that we'll need to do is we need to decide upon which steps to perform and that depends on the customer selection all right so whatever customer chooses here so if he chooses cappuccino then we will have a series of steps that we need to perform to make and dispense cappuccino to the customer now since this is dependent on customer selection then a switch statement can help us with that okay so what we will do is we will have a switch statement written inside the do while loop so i'll say switch and you will see this auto suggest here for switch statement okay now here you will see this by default appear over here okay so it says switch here you have the key and then you have the cases and then you have a default case all right so as you can see switch statement has a key now this key can be an expression okay which is evaluated okay and used to choose from one of the switch cases so we have only one case by default available over here case value okay we can define multiple ones okay so what happens is the expression is evaluated or expression or the key is evaluated to the value okay and then we use that to execute the appropriate case so if this is confusing don't worry it will be all clear in a while so i'll just remove this default for now okay we'll be talking about this default case a bit later but for now what i will do is i will add user choice over here okay so whatever user has entered here okay we take that we convert that to lowercase and in place of our key or the expression we have the value of this variable user choice okay and i'll add a couple of switch cases so that we can see what it looks like okay and as you can see the case for a switch statement starts with the case keyword all right so i'll have the case keyword written here so i'll say i'll say one here okay and here within this i'll say console dot log okay making cappuccino all right i'll copy this so we'll emulate the behavior or we'll simulate the behavior of making a coffee so first we'll steam the milk okay then i'll say so i'll add some steps here okay 
I'll say froth the milk okay and then I'll paste this again I'll just add some steps you can add any steps you like okay so I'll say make espresso and I'll again paste it over here and I'll say add some milk to the espresso all right and we'll even add a break statement over here okay so those are the basic steps that our vending machine will perform okay uh, once you have seen the remaining steps i suggest you to press the refund button and go to the cafe next door their coffee might be much better but what i want to highlight over here is uh, the break statement is very important over here without it the code would try to fall through into the next section some languages allow that and it's very common cause of bugs if break is omitted the execution will proceed to the next case clause even to the default clause regardless of whether the value of the clause matches or not this behavior is called fall through and just make sure you have added break after defining every case block so break causes the execution to jump out of the switch statement i promise that we will look at break in this section because it can be also used with while for and do while loops all right so i'll come back to it because at the moment it's not very obvious why it's here okay it will be a bit more obvious when i have entered the next case statement all right so what i will do is i will just copy this case statement here i'll add one more case statement here okay here and i'll say this is a case 2 okay making latte so we will make espresso so I'll, you can add any steps you want okay we are, we are just learning now so i think that should be fine i'll say steam the milk and add the milk to the espresso i'll just remove this step so far so good okay so you can see we have two case statements now okay two case blocks i should say now without the break here without the break statement over here you may expect the code to continue with making latte message okay on this particular line so javascript insists that you have something like a break statement here to make your code obvious that this does not happen okay i've I, i've added quite a few steps there to show that you can have lots of code in each section so the purpose of adding multiple print like console.log statements is to show you that a case block can have multiple lines of code in each section so i'll keep the remaining ones short or we'll be here all day all right so what i will do is i'll i'll just copy these two lines i'll go down here and okay so here i'll say instead of making latte so okay so i'll just cancel this so instead of making latte uh, we will be making americano okay and we'll change this to three over here okay i'll again go to the next line here and i'll change this to four and this will be mocha now okay i'll again copy paste so this will need some copy pasting over here i'll say macchiato over here and the sixth one will be espresso all right so there are enough of options now here to give you a good idea of what a switch statements look like okay so in the next video we will talk about what can i do or what we can do if the switch choice doesn't match one of those options all right 
so i'll leave you to run this program and uh, see how it works or we can even try running it so i have it open in the browser i'll just hit save okay and here in the browser you will see this prompt okay please choose one of the options i'll say one cappuccino okay it's asking me press two or i'll just press cancel for now i'll first open the console so just make sure that you have console open okay and just refresh i'll say one so you can see first option was executed if i say six you will see making espresso if i press q okay we quit so the program works as is expected you can play around with the program a bit and see how it works and how it behaves if we enter different options all right so that's about this class guys in this lecture we were introduced to a new type of a statement called switch statement we took a look at switch statement and we actually used a switch statement in our simple menu project and we simulated a coffee machine behavior in our program so now you know how switch statement can be used all right in a next few lecture we'll be learning a bit more about switch statement so that you have a complete clarity on this statement so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk a little bit more about switch statement and we are going to discuss the default case in the switch by the end of this lecture you will know why the default case exists and how can you use it in your programs in fact we will be modifying our simple menu program to make use of a default case so i finished the last video by saying i will show you how to add code when none of the case section matches so if you enter an invalid choice when you were experimenting with the program you would have just found out that it would just ignore any key that wasn't recognized so javascript is quite happy for user choice to be something that doesn't have a matching case section we could choose option 9 for example and we wouldn't get an error so let me try that so if i try 9 you won't get an error it will just say you chose 9 if you choose 10 you will just get you choose 10 and there's no error but keep in mind that not all languages behave like that they can crash if you don't cater for all the possible options bear in mind when you come to learn your next language but in javascript this code is perfectly fine sometimes you will want to handle values that aren't explicitly listed in the case sections now how can you do that so you can do that by using the default keyword so i'll switch over to my ide i'll just expand this a bit so that we have a better visibility i'll go here and i'll say default okay i'm sorry default here a colon and here i can say console dot log and i can print the message returning coins okay so let's say like if a user has selected an invalid option then we just return the coins and i'll add break okay so a default section is a bit like final else in the series of if else statement when there is no case section that matches exactly the code in the default section is executed on the previous lines we used the keyword case for the default section we used the keyword default it is followed by a colon just like all the other sections so as you can see over here there is no case keyword used we have just used default keyword followed by a colon all right so let me run this program i'll just hit save 
and I'll say, okay, I'll say 11. All right, let me refresh the code. Okay. Let me refresh this. Let me say 11. You can see you choose and it, it's returning coin. I'll say 12 returning coins. So if you run the program, any key that isn't explicitly checked will return the money as you can see on the console. Now notice if you type in Q, so if I type in Q, that will also return the coins. Okay. So pressing Q also results in coins being returned. No other case matches Q. So that's the default that is being used. Now it's usual to put default section at the end, but you can put it anywhere inside the switch statement. I would suggest you not putting the default section somewhere in the middle because that's just confusing to anyone reading your code. If you use a default section, it should go at the end or maybe at the start. So that's about the default section. All right. And I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to why this keyword or why this kind of section exists and how can you make use of it in your programs. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about handling multiple cases. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity on this concept with switch statements. So our vending machine doesn't make a very good coffee and we are about to make it worse. So cappuccino and latte, if you take a look at, they are quite similar. The main difference is how the milk is poured. So our vending machine has one way to pour the milk. It has only one way. So we can perform exactly the same steps for case one and case two. Now, this isn't really going to be a good way to make a coffee, but it's a good way to show you how to use the same code for more than one cases. And to do that, what I will be doing is I will be putting these two cases. So the case one and the case two together. Now, how am I going to do that? So I'm going to simply comment these lines out here. I'll just comment. So if you want to know the shortcut for comment, you can, you can go to edit and you can see toggle line comment. So it's control and forward slash for my windows machine. If you're using Mac or Linux, this might be different. So you can take a look over here under edit. Okay. The shortcut will be highlighted. And basically you can toggle the comments if you want to. So I can just go here. I can select this again and I can press control forward slash to toggle. Easy, right? So what I will do is I will just hit save and you, what you will see is you will see the same code. So this code being executed for option one and option two. All right. So I'll just cancel this. I'll reload the browser. I'll say two. Okay. You can see we are seeing making latte. If I say one, you will see the same being repeated, but for three, it will be different. So this is how it will work. Okay. And you, as you can see, I selected three over here. Okay. It said, making Americano, Mocha, Macchiato, making Espresso, and then it even said returning coins, right? And there's a reason for this. So this is exactly what I was talking about, the fall through in switch statement. And the reason for this is, if you might have guessed, is I missed the break statements here. So I'll just copy this, okay? I'll just paste it over here here and in every statement. So without break, so without break, the 
code block in the next case statement is also executed even though it doesn't match what you have entered. So for example, here I entered three, it showed me making Americano, but there was no break. So it just started executing making mocha, macchiato, espresso until it finds a break statement. And since there was no break in any of the cases, it just kept executing everything until the default case. So it also returned the coins. So that was a bug. Okay, so you can refresh the code and you can try again. One, two, three, four. You can see it's working perfectly fine, right? Perfect. So far, so good. I'll say Q and I'll quit the program. So this is how you can handle multiple cases together if they, need, they have the same code that needs to be executed. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity on handling multiple cases together in your JavaScript program with your switch statement. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss break statements and how can you use them and how do they work in JavaScript. So by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a clarity on this concept. So now that we know how to test conditions using if, we can go back to loops and see what break and continue can do. We have already seen break in switch statement. Break can also be used to break out of a loop. You may want to do that. For example, if you are searching through a list of things and when you have found the item you want, there's no much point continuing through the loop. And we have seen that in fact in the Eliza project. So do not open that project just yet. The loops in there are quite complicated and it will be easier to see what's going on if we simplify them slightly. So what I will do is I will create another project. Okay. So I'll create a new folder. I'll call this project as list search. Okay. So this is going to be a simplified version of Eliza. I'll copy the index.html and main.js from here. Okay. You can either copy it or you can create your own. That's perfectly fine. I'll simply copy it. Okay. So we have this linking also over here and I'll clear this file here. All right. And lastly, what I will do is I'll just open this file with a live server. I will close everything else and I'll open console and keep. All right. So we have the list search project set up. It has an index.html linked to main.js. All right. Now what I will be doing is I will be adding some code here, which will be a simplified version of Eliza code. All right. And I have this code copy pasted here in my notepad. All right. And you can even find this code and download it as an attachment. So there will be an attachment with this lecture. You can find it and you can get this text file as well. All right. So this is a simplified version of Eliza code. All right. And what I've, I'll do is I ha I'll copy this and I'll paste it over here. Okay. So what I've done is I have reduced the number of matches here. Okay. There are only eight words or phrases that this code will recognize. I have even stripped out some other code and we are left with a for loop that checks. So this is a for loop that checks for a match. Okay. And you can see this for loop starting here this entire piece of code here. Okay. And 
we are using a variable index. Okay, one second. So here we are using a variable index to retrieve item from the matches list. So as you can see over here, we are retrieving the item from the matches list and matches list is here. This is a list at the top. Okay. So when the index is zero, we are fetching life. When the index is one, we are fetching I need and so on. And this is happening because of the for loop. So zero, one, two, it keeps on going from one to 10. Now we can see each string from the list being retrieved here on this line. And each time around the loop, the variable match this variable here will contain the next string according to the value of index. All right. And the same value for index is even used to get the appropriate response over here. In the original code, there were multiple responses on each line and one was chosen at random. Okay. But this is not the case over here. It's pretty simple here. Now, if you scroll down, okay, within this for loop, we have a condition that is being tested inside the loop here. Okay. And this is the condition. So we are evaluating the value of position variable here. So if you can see here on this particular line, the position variable position is given the position in the user input where the current match appears. Okay. So user input is initialized over here. And on this line, we are checking as to where this match appears and user position is given that particular value. Now, if the match doesn't appear, then the position will get the value of minus one. And as you can see over here, like on this line, I have hard coded the value of user input. Okay. So the reason I have hard coded is it's easier to use the debugger if the code is not stopping for the input. Okay. So since we are learning, it's okay to work with some hard coded values. All right. So the code will find the match when it's checking the string I need. Okay. So if you scroll up here, it will check for the string I need and it will find the string over here. I need. All right. So we know that it starts at position eight because of this comment over here. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code and we will set a breakpoint and we'll observe the code as to what's happening further. All right. So I'll just open this in the browser. Okay. If it's open for you, well and good. I'll do right click inspect. I'll switch over to application here. Sorry, not application, but sources. This is where you need to work with debugging and here. Okay. So I just changed the alignment over here. Okay. And just make it this way. Okay. So this is better to watch now in main.js. If I scroll down a bit, okay, I'll just scroll down. And I'll put a breakpoint over here at the if statement. All right. And I'll run the code. Okay. And you can see the debugger has stopped at the if statement here. Okay. Now, if you look at the bottom pane over here, you can see that the index is zero, which means that this is first time round the loop. All right, index is set to zero. The match is set to life over here. And this match doesn't appear in user input, which means that the position is set to minus one. All right. So what we will do is we'll click resume here and go around again. And this time, this is the second iteration of the for loop. Okay. And you can see we are searching for the string I need. So match has the string I need and we have found it at position eight. 
okay which is exactly i mentioned before and the value of the index is 1 which indicates this is the second iteration of the for loop it started from 0 over here all right so index 1 means it's the second iteration now what i will be doing is i will be doing a step over over here okay so let me do step over so if i do a step over you will see the output is still empty i'll press that once again and now you will see output has a value okay here and this is the line that got executed and you can see output has a value now here in the bottom pane and the string that it has is why do you need percentage one so the code has now found a match and there is no need to keep going around the loop it's a waste of time to carry on searching for something once you have found it and in this case we have found it right and that's why we have a break statement here on line 37 that is highlighted right now on in the debugger you can see it's currently highlighted and when this line is executed okay the execution will jump out of the loop so let me press this button again so you can see we are now out of the for loop so we are now on this particular line here and this is outside the loop so break statement helped us exit the for loop okay and also if you notice this bottom pane here you will see that the variables like index match and position do not exist so you don't see their values and neither those variables that you were seeing earlier so those variables were all declared inside the for loop and don't exist once we leave it we need the value of output which is why it is declared before the loop was started so outside the loop you have this variable being de declared okay and there's a reason why it was declared outside the loop because we would be needing that variable outside the loop and you can see we are using it outside the loop okay so that's the break statement it's used to jump out of for while or a do while loop and also a switch statement as we saw in few of our previous lectures all right so that's about this class guys in this lecture we understood what is break statement and how break statement works we learned the functionality and the behavior of the break statement by creating a simple version of eliza all right so you can press resume and you can just see the output being printed here on the console so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss the continue keyword in javascript and we are actually going to use this keyword and learn about its use cases by using it in an actual program so this lecture is going to be very exciting so what is continue keyword so continue causes the current loop to skip any remaining code and go back round again so this is different to break which jumps out of the loop as an example of when continue can be useful let's take a look at our simple menu project so what i will be doing is i'll be closing these files i'll open the project explorer and i'll switch over to our simple menu project i'll also open it with the live server here all right yeah so here in the simple menu project we have forgotten a quite an important step the code doesn't dispense the coffee so if you look at it it just makes the coffee 
and we are not dispensing the coffee so each of the option goes through the process of making the various flavors but it doesn't contain any instruction to give the coffee to the consumer so i'll add that instruction after the switch statement once the coffee has been made we'll give it to the consumer so here if you scroll down this is where the switch statement ends okay so i'll just add it over here so i'll say console dot log okay and i'll say dispensing coffee all right i'll end this with the semicolon i'll copy this as well and i'll duplicate this line and i'll just greet the user so i'll say have a nice day all right so this is what we have written now let me save the code okay let me go to the browser and let me hit refresh okay so now when you run the program okay i choose let me choose 3 okay one mistake we haven't opened our console so just make sure you open your console i'll just hit refresh again i'll say 3 okay you can see that we have making americano dispensing coffee and have a nice day which is good it it is making the coffee and it is also dispensing and also greeting me which is fair enough if i choose 5 it will work the similar way okay and you can even check the other option i'll leave you to check that they work the similar way okay now what happens if i choose an invalid option so let me choose the option 9 this is an invalid option so if i say 9 okay it says returning coins dispensing coffee have a nice day all right so if you go over here so we have selected an invalid option so what happens is default case is being executed which says returning coins and then there is a break so we break out of the loop and then these two statements are being executed so this is incorrect so if you look at it we are even returning the coins and we are also dispensing the co coffee to the user we cannot do that okay and how can we avoid these two statements from being executed so the answer is we can do that by using continue here rather than a break all right so i'll replace this break statement with continue which here so break statement caused the execution to leave the switch okay so break was here earlier and it left the switch statement and it started executing over here but continue what continue is going to do is continue will cause the enclosing loop to skip any further instructions which means it jumps to this condition over here okay so it will directly jump here i'm sorry this condition the condition is tested again and the loop goes round again if the user didn't press q so that's the continue statement for you okay so i'll save this file okay i'll refresh okay and i'll test for 3 works fine 6 works fine 9 it works fine as you can see we are just returning coins okay and we have been again presented with this option okay and the option is to choose any of the following option and the coffee is not being dispensed and neither we are being greeted now which is exactly what we wanted all right so our program is now waiting for another choice all right now if you enter q the loop is terminated all right so that's the continue statement for you so like i said continue is exactly like i can say opposite of break okay break will cause you to break the loop whereas continue will skip the remaining code and take you to the next iteration of the loop 
So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the scope of break and continue statements. And I just wanted to create this video to make sure that there is no confusion about what break and continue are doing in our simple menu program. So let's get started. So if you click on any of the case labels on Windows, Visual Studio helpfully highlights all the case labels and the break statements. When used inside a switch like this, break breaks out of the switch. You can use break with switch and also with for loops as well as while and do while loops. Whichever one you use it with, it breaks out of whatever immediately contains it. All those break statements are inside the switch, which is why they break out of switch, but they don't break out of the do while loop over here. Okay. So since break is inside the switch, we break out of the switch statement and not of the do while loop. So break is used to break out of whatever immediately contains it. So JavaScript knows what encloses them and that's what they break out of. Just to be clear, if we want to break out of the do while loop, we have to put the break outside the switch. So if I go over here, okay. And if I put a break statement over here, let's say, so I'll say break semicolon. Okay. Now I won't run the program. You can do that yourself if you want to check what's happening but we can tell the remaining code in the loop won't be executed because Visual Studio tells us. So if you hover on this line here after break, you will see a tool tip that's saying unreachable code. Okay. And you can see that on both the lines and they have been marked in sort of a gray color, like the color has just faded out. So you can see this one is in a better color and this has just faded out and it indicates that it's an unreachable statement. Okay. So I'll undo that change for now. Okay. Now looking at the continue statement over here that works with loops here, it appears inside a do while loop, which is why the execution continues to this particular part over here. Okay, the continue causes the containing loop to continue. You can nest a continue statement inside switch and if statements, but it's the enclosing loop that it causes to continue. So that's about the break statement and the continue statement guys. So I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how they both behave and how they are working in our simple menu project. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about ternary conditional operator. And we, by the end of this lecture, you would have a complete understanding of what this operator is and how can you use it in your JavaScript programs. So let's get started. This section so far has been about flow control, mainly using if and switch. The ternary conditional operator doesn't really alter the program's flow, but I'm including it here because it can be used as an alternative to if else. So in this video, I'll introduce it and we will see what it does. We will be using it in more realistic examples as we work through the course. But for now, I'll use a simple example to show what it does. 
So I will create a new project. Okay, I'll create a new folder here. I'll call ternary. Okay. And I'll copy these two files index.html and main.js into this folder. Okay, they lacked as the template for us. All right. Now in main.js, I'll just clear out this code so that we have a fresh file. Okay. So here now I'll start writing in some code. Okay. So I'll say let day is equal to prompt. We'll use the prompt function and I'll say what day is it? So we are asking user what day is it? All right. Now here I'll create one more variable how to spend time. All right. And we have not assigned anything over here to how to spend time yet. All right. So I'll say if day dot to lowercase. Okay. So if day dot to lowercase is equal to Saturday, then we can say that how to spend time is equal to relax. Correct. You will relax on Saturday. Okay. Or else I say how to spend time is equal to work. So if it's Saturday, I set how to spend time as relax. And if it's not, then I set it to work. All right. And then we'll print the results. We'll say console dot log. And now here I'll print the value. I'll say console dot log. Okay. And I'll say dollar how to spend time. We'll use this variable. Okay. And we'll say on day. All right. So I like to mix things up a bit. Okay. To show you different ways of doing the same thing. So in this example, I have called two lowercase over here. You can see, and this is a method that will convert our D value to the lowercase. And we have seen this method a few times and I'm just calling it in a different place over here. So instead of converting the input to lowercase on this line, I said I will convert it when I want to check if it's equal to Saturday. So because strings are immutable, day will keep its original case, but the comparison will be performed on a lower case version of day. Okay, so this is a pretty simple example. On Saturdays, we relax and on any other day we work. So I'll save the file. Okay, and I'll run the index.html over here. All right. Now, We'll run to see we are getting the output that we expect. So I'll just open the console and I'll say Monday. So it says work on Monday. Cool. I'll say Saturday. It says relax on Saturdays. So it works as expected. You can test it out yourself. Now, when you use a simple if else to assign a value to a variable, like we are doing over here, you can actually replace it with a ternary conditional operator. All right. So what I will do is I will just comment this code out and I'll show you how ternary operator works. All right. So when you use ternary conditional operator, you start with a condition. All right. So what I will be doing here is I will say how to spend time is equal to day dot to lowercase here. So I'll just start with this condition. I'll just copy instead of just typing it all there. All right. 
Now, this is exactly the same condition we had in the if statement. All right. Now, followed by the condition, okay, we will add a question mark. Okay. So I'll say a question mark over here. And then the value to assign if the condition is true. All right. So we will say relax because if this is true, we want to relax. And after the colon, so we'll have a colon then. Okay. And then we have a value to assign when the condition is false. So we'll say work. All right. So I'll reiterate, we have the condition first. Okay. Then, so this is the entire condition. I'm sorry. And then we have a question mark after which we have the value that we want to consider once the condition is true. Okay. Now, if the condition is false, like you will have a separate value, okay, which you have to place after the colon over here. Now, this is a lot more concise and when you get used to it, it's also more readable. Although you may disagree with that right now, but when you get used to it, it's like a wonderful thing. So like you have just reduced like these many lines of code into a single line. All right. So that's a simple example as to how to use a ternary conditional operator. The code is far from perfect. Like if you enter holiday, for example, it will say work on holiday. Okay. So welcome to the life as a programmer. So the original if else also did the same thing, but we have changed the behavior of the code. We have just written it differently. All right. So I'll save this and we will test it what day is it it's saturday it says relax on saturday and i'll run this i'll say monday it says work on monday so it works exactly the same way as it was working for the if else condition so that's about this class guys and that's also about what the turn ternary conditional operator is so I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how it works. In this lecture, we learned about this operator and we also used it in a simple program to understand how it works. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to take a look at the ternary conditional operator in our hammer Bitcoin project. All right. So what we'll be doing is we will switch over. So I'll close this file and I'll switch over to our hammer Bitcoin project here. Okay. And I'll open the Bitcoin miner.js file here. Now, Let's see how we can use the ternary operator in a real program. All right. So what I will be doing is I will scroll down over here. So we have count new hires method somewhere over here. So let me search for that here. So this is our count new hires method. All right. And the code checks to see if any employee has staffed. And if they have, the number of employees is set to zero, as you can see over here. Sorry, this is the number of new employees is set to zero. And starving your employees isn't an ideal way to attract new ones, right? And if nobody starved, then what we are doing is the code is calculating a number of new employees based on the existing number and how many computers and cash the company has. All right. Now you have to do a challenge here. All right. And the challenge is to replace that if else with the ternary operator. All right. So it's a small challenge wherein you will be replacing this with the ternary conditional operator. And I think it will give you a good hands-on exercise as to how can you use ternary conditional operator in real world programs. And 
try this out and we'll go over the solution in the upcoming lecture. So that's about this class guys. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to go over the challenge solution. Okay. So rather than type the condition, okay, what I will be doing is I will be copying the condition from here. Okay. I'll copy it without parenthesis. All right. And I'll start adding the code over here. Okay. I'll say is equal to this or I'll add the parenthesis here. Yep. Now I'll say question mark zero. Okay. And then here I'll add a colon and then I'll copy this till the end. And I'll end this with a semicolon. Now what I can do is I can simply remove the if else condition entirely. Okay. It's not needed. Okay. And then, so there we were printing the console.log as well. So if I do control Z, we were printing something on the console. Okay. That statement is not needed. So I'll just remove it. Okay. Because we have an interface for this particular program and the interface displays the value in the browser. Now I can just do some alignment here. Okay. I will have this here and this part here. Okay. So this is the condition. Okay. And the same condition that we had written using if else has now been converted to like the functionality is same, but it's now written using ternary conditional operator. Okay. Now I won't run the program in the video, but you should check that it still works. Now remember to enter a suitable amount to distribute to make sure a small number of employees staff. If you don't test that, you can't be sure that the modif modified code is working correctly. All right. The code can be shortened still further, but I'll leave that for a later video. So this is the ternary conditional operator. We have the condition here, then followed by the question mark, the value that is assigned if this condition is true and followed by the colon, we have some calculation, which is calculated to a value and that value is assigned if this condition is false. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys now have the challenge solution. And I hope you guys were able to solve it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section summary of all the things that we have learned. In this section, we have looked at another way to alter the flow of execution. We executed different blocks of code depending on some condition. Conditional execution tests condition also known as Boolean expressions to decide which block of code to execute. We introduced the if statement using a simple rock paper scissors game. Although they are not related to flow control, this was a good time to look at const declarations, which means constants, which can make the code more readable. They also help to prevent the kind of bugs you can get from typing a value in differently each time. Repeated if statements can be inefficient and we saw how using if and else can make the code more efficient by reducing the number of conditions that have to be evaluated. Else also lets us test several conditions and execute a different block of code for each one. Another way to do that 
is the switch statement that's a good alternative once you get more than about three conditions to test if else can be useful to modify the behavior of loops by using the break and continue statements we can terminate a loop early using break or get it to skip some code by using continue switch statements can also have a default case section to handle the case when none of the explicit case sections match we finished with a the ternary operator which can produce more concise code when an if else is used to assign different values to the same variable so that's what we have covered so far in this section all right and that's the end of this section okay so i hope you guys enjoyed this section and found this section valuable i'll see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to do a section introduction and we'll be discussing what we are going to cover in this section we have been using methods and functions a lot in this course in this section it's time to learn more about them we'll learn how can you declare your own methods and what parameters and arguments are methods can return a value and we'll be looking at return keyword to see how to do that using global variables can result in code that's difficult to maintain because it's difficult to work out exactly where something is being changed class fields are an example of global variables we'll learn how to refactor code to reduce or in some cases completely eliminate side effects that change global variables don't worry i'll be explaining terms like global variables side effects and refactoring in the lectures or videos while we are doing all that we'll talk about variable scope we'll see that a method can declare parameters and local variables that only exist inside the method that's different to class fields which are available everywhere inside the class including in its methods so that is what we are going to cover briefly in this section so i am excited and i hope you guys are too so see you inside thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss about calling methods and we are going to discuss how calling method works and how it alters the flow of the program so let's get started so the discussion of methods often starts with what they are and a load of jargon about parameters and arguments and so forth i'm going to take a different approach here and we are going to start looking at what happens when you call them we have already got a project with some methods so we have a project class intro so i would request you all to move to that project here okay so this is the file that we have with some methods and this is the project that we used uh, in one of our previous sections all right so i'll launch this project in the browser all right and i'll go to inspect and i'll go to sources over here i will expand this a bit and here in main.js i'll scroll down and once i scroll down i will set a breakpoint here on this particular line where we are about to call the method accelerate all right so we have got a car class here 
So this is the car class and it has two public methods. One is accelerate, brake, and one private method show speed. Now, because they are public, we can call accelerate and break methods from outside the class. So you can see over here, we are calling them. Now we create a new car object here and call its methods from here. Okay. Now to see how calling a method affects the flow of execution of the program, we have set a breakpoint in our browser here on this line where we are calling the method accelerate. So we will start the debugger. I'll refresh this page and you can see the debugger stops on this particular line here. Now, when you call a method, you have to use opening and closing parentheses as you can see over here. And this opening and closing parentheses is after the method name. So at the moment, the accelerate method doesn't take any arguments. So we don't have anything between the opening and the closing parentheses. We will be changing that soon. So don't worry about it just yet. Now, when we enter the debug mode, it's a good time to also take a look at the call stack. So here you can see this call stack, which you can even collapse. Okay. If it is collapsed by default, I would request you all to open this. All right. So we will observe the call stack over here. All right. And we will step into the function call. So we are here on line 25. So I'll say step into. Now the moment I hit step into, you will see that we are now inside the accelerate method here. All right. And if you take a look at the bottom here in the call stack, you can observe that we can see accelerate being added here. All right. And you can see that we are on line number nine here. So main.js nine. And that is what is the line number being displayed over here. One thing I don't like about this call stack is it shows uh, where you came from, not where you will return to. Okay. So it's showing you that you came from main.js line 25 and that was not a method. So here it's written anonymous. Okay. Well, uh, it's not talking about where I'll return to, but what do I mean by that? Well, when the accelerate code has finished, the next bit of code to be executed will be on line 26. So this next line will be executed. But you can see anonymous here written with the line number. Let's see that happening. Before I talk more about it, we will step over carefully. Okay. So instead of step into, we will do step over. So now I am on the end of this method, which is the last line and the end of the accelerate method. So you can see over here, we are on line 10. All right. I'll again press step over. Okay. We are at the curly brace now. All right. Now we are on line 26. So when we press step over again, we are on line 26. Now you will notice that the debugger still highlights the line number 25 here. So this line where we have set the breakpoint and that is because we have set the breakpoint there and that is why it's being highlighted. Whenever you call a method in your code, the execution jumps to the first statement in the method. The code in the method is then executed. When the method finishes, the execution continues with the statement after the method call. So right now we are on line number 26 and in the call stack, you will observe that the accelerate entry is now removed because we have returned and we are out of our method. 
okay now here we are about to call the accelerate method again and i can press step into and go into that method again and i can see that method being executed right then and there and you can see the speed started with zero it's now incremented to two over here okay and if i press step over okay we will come back to the next line you will notice that we pressed step over when we were inside the method call over here okay and that is because we didn't want to go into the show speed method because that's method calling another method and this is something that we will discuss in our upcoming video now looking at the call stack we are at line 27 okay which means that this line okay so if i say so this line got executed 27 now we are at 28 and so on okay so yeah so that is how the method call works so whenever you do a method call okay the first statement in the method is started to execute and once all the statements in the method are executed the statements after the method call are being executed one by one so that's about this class guys this is how method call works and this is how call stack is managed whenever you call a method all right so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about how the call stack works or what is the behavior when methods call another methods. And by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a complete clarity of this. And we are going to learn this again with the help of our debugger so let's get started so in our previous lecture we saw what happens when you call a method in your code execution jumps to the method you called then returns when the method terminates the computer keeps track of where your code will return to on something called a stack because the return address is tracked, the computer always knows where it has to jump back to. That means you can call methods from methods and the system copes just fine. So we can see that with class intro project that we have been working on. Okay, I'll just clear this breakpoint here on line 25 and I'll set another one. So I'll go to the accelerate method and I'll set another breakpoint here on this line within accelerate method where we are calling the show speed method. All right. Now I'll hit refresh. So let me hit refresh and you will see that the debugger has stopped on this line 10. In the call stack window, you will see like we are tracking the return address of main.js, which is line 25. And then at line 10, we have stopped. All right, here. Now, what I will be doing is instead of stepping over, I'll say step into. So with the help of step into, we will go inside this function show speed. So I'll say step into. The moment I say step into, so you can see our call stack and it has now grown. The top of the stack shows the line that's currently being executed and below that are all the points that the code will return to when each method finishes. As we have seen, because of the way debugger shows things when stepping through the code, okay, each time you call a method, the address to return is pushed onto the stack 
when the function returns that address is popped off the stack and execution jumps to that address. The debugger won't jump into JavaScript classes. So I can use either step over or step into a couple of times. I'll use step into twice just to demonstrate that we won't step into the console.log method. So I'll use step into, let's, let me see. Okay, so we didn't step into the console.log method. So when you are executing code that debugger can't step into, step over and step into do exactly the same thing. Okay, the message has been written to the console. You can see over here, all right. And this message is now printed on the console and the debugger is on line 20 as of now. And that's the end of the method, which means step into will cause it to jump back to where we came from, which is the line number 10. So I'll say step into, and you can see we are on line 11 now. Okay. So we return to line 10 and then onto the next line. Okay. Now we have returned to the accelerate method. Okay. And you can notice that show speed method is now removed from the call stack. And because there was no more code to execute in show speed, that is that entry is removed. So there's no more code in the accelerate method either. So you won't be surprised when step into takes us back to the next line 26. So I'll say step into and we will go to line 26. So that's how method calls work. Okay. When you call a method execution jumps to the code in that method. When the method finishes, the execution goes back to the statement after the method call. So I'll leave you to step through the remainder of the code to make sure that you perfectly understand what's going on. And in the upcoming videos, we'll take a look at parameters and arguments. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we will be discussing about method parameters. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what method parameters are and how can you use them. So let's get started. And for the sake of this, we will be using the car project over here. So classes intro is the name of the folder and we have the car class over here and that is what we are going to use. So open the project if you haven't already and let's take a look at the accelerate method. So at the moment, if you see accelerate method increases the speed by one each time it's called. Now that doesn't accurately reflect how a real car works. So you don't press the accelerator to go one mile an hour faster and then press it again to increase the speed by one another one mile per hour and so on. In a real car, how hard you press the pedal determines how quickly the car accelerates. So we can model that behavior by providing the accelerate method with a value that represents the amount of acceleration. That's what a parameter is. It's a variable that becomes available inside the method. We declare a parameter in a similar way to any other variable, but we put the declaration inside the parenthesis. So what I'm going to do is I am going to have a variable here and I'm going to say amount 
So this is the variable that we have declared. Okay. And we have put the declaration within the parenthesis. Note that we are only using the declaration here. We are not assigning a value to amount. Inside the method, we can use amount parameter to alter how much speed increases. Okay, so I can say speed plus plus is equal to amount. So far so good. So our accelerate method now has a parameter called amount and we use that on line number nine, as you can see this line here. And this parameter is used to increase the value of the speed. So if this operator plus equal to does not make sense, it's a shorthand way of writing. Okay, I'll add the long form of this. So it's a shorthand way of saying this dot speed is equal to this dot speed plus amount. So that is what this line means. Okay. And it's a shorthand version of the same. The computer evaluates the expression as speed plus amount and assigns that value back to the speed. Now there's no difference between the two ways of writing the code. You can use whichever you find easier to read. Okay. The first form speed plus is equal to just looks much more convenient, simpler and is more common though. Okay. You can even use this form. There is, there are no issues with that, but this is more common. All right. Now, we have this parameter defined here. Okay. Now we need to provide this parameter a value. What I will do is I'll say five over here and I'll say 30 over here and I'll just delete all the other calls. Okay. To accelerate, to keep things simple. So I'll just remove this. Okay. And I'll remove this as well. All right. Now, these values that I've added over here are called arguments. If a method is defined as having parameter, the values for the parameter are provided by the arguments when the method is called. So you can see these are arguments and this is a parameter. So how does parameter get value? It gets value in the form of arguments. I hope this is clear. Now this value five over here and value 30 over here are arguments to the method. Okay. Now my car should accelerate up to by five miles per hour and then accelerate again to 35 miles per hour. So I'll run the program. I'll save this and we will see the output. So you can see initially it was five, 35, then we apply brake, so it's 34. And then this is another instance of the car here, as you can see, and that's going to minus one, which is fine. So the program looks good. I even noticed that I was exceeding the speed limit and I braked slightly. I haven't braked enough though. The urban speed limit here is about 31 miles per hour. And I don't want to keep pressing the brake pedal. So your job is to fix my car. So we want the brake method to behave like the accelerate method, except that it will slow down rather than speeding up, of course. And yes, it's time for a challenge. So the challenge is to modify the code so that the brake method has a parameter and reduces the speed by the value of that parameter. When you have done that, provide a suitable argument when calling the method like here, so that my speed reduces to 31 miles per hour. 
use whatever value you want for the bat mobile when calling break method well any value except zero we want to test that the car speed doesn't go negative and i'll go over my solution in the next video so that's about method parameters guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what method parameters are and how do they work so in this lecture we understood method parameters method arguments and we actually use them in our classes intro project which simulates the behavior of our car and we ended the lecture with a challenge so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss the solution to the parameter challenge so how did you get on did you manage to get my car to slow down by a specific amount to do that we will start by defining a parameter for the break method in case it wasn't obvious we can call our parameters anything we want within the rule of variable name of course so i'll call it speed reduction so i'll scroll up here and i'll call it here speed reduction okay but you may have to use a different name and that's fine all right so here you can use speed reduction like we have used the amount in the accelerate method so i'll say minus equal to speed reduction here so now we have defined a parameter for the break method we can have to provide a suitable argument when calling it all right so i need to slow my car by 4 miles per hour so i'll scroll down and i'll add this parameter over here and i'll slow my bat mobile car by 15 miles per hour as a test that the method works now i'll hit save and our program will get reloaded automatically and you can see that it appears to work we are within the speed limit here and here we have still got the bat mobile going backwards when we apply the brakes but our parameters are working fine okay so as an example of using parameters in the methods this code isn't bad as an example of modeling the behavior of the car it's horrible okay so for now we'll ignore the fact that we accelerated the poor passengers from 0 to 35 miles per hour in less than half a second then deaccelerated by 4 miles per hour in a fraction of that time if i keep driving like that they will be battered wrecks before i've gone a mile so we really need to specify how fast we want to accelerate and as well as the speed we want to accelerate up to we will do that when we come to look at operators in the later sections so you do know everything you need to prevent brakes from sending the car backwards which sounds like another challenge <laughs> so let's talk about the challenge now so as you work through the course the challenges will involve topics that are covered in the earlier sections as well as the topics from the current section as well and that's the case with this challenge which is to modify the brake method so that it doesn't reduce the car speed below zero have a go and i'll show you my solution in the upcoming lecture so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity on this challenge solution and i'll see you guys soon thank you
Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about the solution to the break challenge. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clear understanding as to what are the different solutions or different ways in which this challenge can be solved. All right. And we will be actually doing the practical for the same. So let's get started. So there are a number of ways to solve this challenge. The real test is, does it work? So if your code doesn't make the car go backwards, regardless of its current speed and the amount of braking you apply, then well done. The basic solution is to compare the speed reduction value. So here, the speed reduction value with the speed and not allow the speed to become negative. As I said, there are several ways you could do that. They all involve using an if statement, but you can use several conditions. I'll show you a few ways of doing it. The first way is to perform the subtraction as normal, then check if the speed is less than zero. If it is, set it to zero. So once we have done the subtraction, I will add an if statement over here, okay? And I'll say this dot speed is less than zero. Then this dot speed is equal to zero. We can run the program. So I'll save this and you will see it being reloaded on the browser here. And you can see that we are getting the output. Bat mobile is going at zero miles per hour, which was negative early on. That's one approach. Now you may have decided to perform the test first and I'll copy that code and comment it out so that it's available for you to check. So I'll copy this. I'll comment this and I'll paste it over here. All right. So I'll modify the method to perform the test first and set the speed to zero if it would otherwise have dropped below zero. All right. So what I will do is I'll say if this dot speed is less than speed reduction, then this dot speed is equal to zero. So else I would say this dot speed. So I'll move this to else. All right, here. And then I'll press a backspace like so. So this is another way of doing the same thing. I'll hit save and you will see the same output over here. All right. So this has the same effect but it just does it differently. All right. And you can run the program again and you can see that the car is doing 31 miles per hour. So this is Ferrari. All right. And the Batmobile speed is zero. Okay. Now there is one more way of doing this same thing. So you could have written this condition by using the ternary conditional operator instead of the if else condition. All right. So I'll comment this entire thing again here. Like so. Sorry, before commenting, I'll just copy it and then I'll comment and I'll paste it here. Okay. And now I'll say, so I'll copy this, this dot speed. Okay, I'll say is equal to and I'll copy this condition here. So this entire condition. Okay. And if this condition is true, then I'll assign zero. If not, then I'll pass this on. Okay. And I'll, I can remove this condition now. All right. So it's the same if con else condition, 
but it is being written in the form of the ternary operator. All right. So you can run the program. I'll hit save results will refresh here and you can see it works the same way. The output is, is exactly the same. So that's three ways of doing exactly the same thing. They all work. And you may have found yet another way to write it. I just know that someone is going to ask which is the best. The answer here is that none of them are significantly better or worse than any other. There's a difference of at most five instructions between the fastest and the slowest. And no, I'm not going to tell you which was the fastest. It's far better to write code in a way that makes sense to you rather than worrying about a few instruction cycles. On a CPU executing billions of instructions per second, you would have to be doing some pretty advanced stuff to worry about it. So this is about this class guys. So in this lecture, we went through the solution for the break challenge and we took a look at different ways of doing this challenge all right so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to start setting up a simple car game on our Visual Studio IDE. All right. So to begin with, I have two text files that I have already opened over here. You can see. So these are the two text files. First one is cargame.html.text. Then we have cargame.js.text. So one is the HTML code and another one is the JS code, which is the JavaScript code. And you can find both these files as an attachment with this lecture. All right. So the first thing that I will be doing is moving this code from my notepad to the IDE. All right. So I'll first copy the car game dot HTML here and I'll create a new folder. I'll call this as car game. Now within car game folder, I'll add an HTML file. I'll call this file as index.html. Now I'll need one more file, which is the JS file. Like JS file is the file where this HTML file is linking to. And we have the code for the JS file. So I'll just copy this code and the file name should be main.js. So I'll create main.js in the same folder here. So I'll say main.js. I'll paste it here and I'll hit save. Okay. So the code we are using here is based on the class intro code that we have just been looking at. And this is a simple text based driving game. And we have some ready made code, which has helped us save some time and effort here. Okay, we are seeing some error over here. And the error is the JS file is not properly copied for me. So this is the JS file. I'll control C and I'll have to paste it here. I hope the error goes away. Yep, it, it went away. So you need to now open the JS file. I'll just collapse this and I'll close all the other tabs. I'll just keep these two tabs open and I'll have a look at the JS file. So in the JS file, you can see the car class over here on the first line. And this is almost the same like the other project classes intro, which we have been looking at. We have made one change. 
like we need to access the car's speed from the main code and it was marked as private okay so here you can see it's marked as private so don't worry too much about the change i just didn't want to make the field public because that's frowned upon in many object oriented languages so you may spot another change as well okay wherein you will see the speed is multiplied by 10 over here that's not really necessary but a car doing 10 miles per hour down the track isn't terribly exciting the program therefore prints or reports 100 miles per hour instead the speed is multiplied by 10 over here okay so rest of the stuff we have seen before and if you scroll down here you can see i have declared loads of constants and when you interact with the program in the browser the corresponding value of the key is passed into the program and these are the key values that the program will respond to for example a turns the car left d turns the car to the right and s goes straight as you can see over here okay and that may seem like an odd choice especially when you see that w and x are used to accelerate and brake if you wish to you may choose to replace those characters with the key you prefer to use which is perfectly fine there's a change that i want to make you have to scroll a little bit down and you will see this function drive within this function drive you have a switch case and within the switch case you're seeing that the character a is being used in the case instead of the constant which we have already defined now that will cause a problem if you change the key for left and it also means that we have had to include a comment at line like this next line over here which is like the line number 68 i would suppose yeah so we had to include a comment to indicate what's happening right so another advantage of using constants is that they help to document the code so i'll change the line on 68 over here or oh, not 68 so 67 here this one okay i'll change the line and i'll change it to i'll say left and now you can see that we have the liberty to delete the code okay uh, sorry delete the comment so comment is what we deleted because this now indicates that this is for the left it's still obvious now what this case is doing and we don't have to use a comment to explain it now one bit of code that we haven't covered is if you scroll down here you can see a function like this is the function draw road okay and i'm going to talk about string methods soon in the upcoming section in fact but basically you can see a line over here like this line and this entire line what it does is it's inserting the car symbol into the road string okay so there is a road string which is defined at the top and this particular line is entering the or i should say inserting the car symbol into the road string and that makes car appear on the track when the road is printed now you can see that we are using the slice method to do that and the position of the car is given by the car position parameter as you can see over here when we call the method we provide the position of the car the symbol for the car is inserted into the string at that position and the string is created and printed out now as i said we will look at various string methods really soon so have a read through the code before the next lecture to get a feel of what it's doing review the earlier video if there's anything else that doesn't make sense so i will be going through the code 
in the upcoming lectures. Let's first see it running. So what I will be doing is I will head over to index.html in our project explorer. I'll say right click and open with live server. So you can see the game over here launched in the browser. You can see some instructions being displayed over here. Now you need to press accelerate to start the car first. All right. So I'll press accelerate and it will ask for the amount by which you wish to accelerate. So I'll set the acceleration factor as one and I'll say, okay. And you will see our new speed coming up over here. So our Batmobile car is now going at 10 miles per hour. Okay. I'll say, okay. And you can use left to go left that of the track and with the position of the car being printed out. So I'll say left. You can see we're going left. All right. And you can press left a few times, like three, four times to, to get an idea of what's happening. Each time the car moves left whenever you press this button left. Now 10 miles per hour is boring. So I'll press accelerate again and I'll enter the acceleration factor to, so I'll set it to nine. I'll say, okay. Now Batmobile is going hundred miles per hour. Okay. So that's interesting. And what I will do is I'll press straight now. So you can see the car is going straight, right? It's better to go right or we are going to crash. So we'll say right. Okay. And I'll go left. So you can just play around left and right. Okay. So if you want to slow down a bit, I can press accelerate and I can set the acceleration factor to four. Okay. And you can see Batmobile is going to 140 miles per hour. Okay. So that accelerated. So I'll press brake and I'll say four. Okay. You can see we reduce the speed by 40 miles per hour. Okay. I'll even reduce, I'll say four and it's now going at 60 miles per hour. Okay. The speed is reduced by four further. Now I can go straight. You can see me going straight this time and we didn't travel that far. So when it was at hundred miles per hour, we saw a long line coming over here. Okay. Now we see a smaller line relatively. Okay. We have only gone six rows. So this is, these are six rows approximately. And earlier the line was longer because we were going faster. So just play around with the game in the browser. It's a small little simple game. Okay. Uh, to give you a sense of what's happening and how can you use JavaScript to create browser based things like basically a game in this case. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we set up a simple car game in our ID and we actually saw it running in the browser. We also went through a little bit of code in this lecture and I would request you all to read through the JavaScript file and the HTML file to understand what's happening. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about public and private methods. So I hope most of the code made sense to you. Now let us go to the main.js here. And as you can see here, after declaring a few variables, so at the top we have the definition for the class and then after declaring a few variables, we create an instance of a class over here. Okay. And we are calling it the bat mobile and the next few lines, we are printing out the instructions. And these are the instructions that you saw on the screen when the car was launched. 
So there's nothing tricky here. Okay, so you can see that we have assigned some values here. So here in the constant declaration, you will see that we have assigned value to left, right, straight, and which are being used in our code. All right. So this is being used to identify which key in the browser was pressed. Now there are two group of controls that player can use and they have to be handled separately. So the first group are the digits zero to nine. They all do the same thing. That is they alter the acceleration factor and we handle that using the accelerate function over here. So here you can see this tiny function which handles the acceleration and you can see the prompt that is being created here enter the amount by when by which the accelerate enter the amount by which the acceleration will happen so enter the amount by which the car will accelerate okay so i'm not printing the message correctly but i hope you get a sense of what's happening here now this is accelerate function. Then we have another function over here, as you can see. Before talking about this function, I would like to also talk about this parsent over here. So here, when you have the prompt, the input that you get from the user is in the form of a string. And in order to do any calculations, we need it in the form of an integer. And that is where we are converting it into an integer. Another thing I want to point out is within the drive function, we have a switch case. We are also having if statement inside the switch case. Okay. This is a valid and a very useful technique. Okay. And there is something that I want to change now. Okay. So, if you look at our game in the browser here, we have provided a key to let the player check the car's speed. Okay. But if you click on info, it doesn't work yet. Okay. And at the moment, the player has to either accelerate or brake to find out how fast they are going. Now slamming on brakes just to check your speed isn't a very good way to drive. So let's fix it. And what I want to do is I want to show the speed when they press the info key. All right. And if you go into our code here, that is the I key over here. And this is if in the HTML, this is the button that you can see, which has the value I that is being passed when you click this info button. So you can see this dot value is being passed into the drive function over here. Okay. So this is the drive function and this is then being used in the switch case. Now, if you scroll down here, you have info. Okay. And it's commented out at the moment. So I'll delete these two slashes at the start. Okay. And I'll hit and you will see like I'll hit save. Now in the browser, let us see what's happening. Okay. Nothing is happening. If I click on info. Okay. So we are getting an error now if we click on info. So one thing you should make a note of is all the error that you get over here will be on the console. Okay. So you need to navigate to console. If something is not working to see what is the error we have got. And you can see that it says show speed is not a function. Okay. So why is it not a function? So let me scroll up for that. Now, if you see in the car class, you can see here it is being marked as private. Okay. So I'll just make it public here. 
Now I mentioned that briefly when we created a car class earlier, but I didn't go into detail. So if a class member is marked as private, it can only be used inside the class. Any attempt to access it from outside the class, like we were doing over here, will give you an error. So to make member available outside the class, we can mark it as public and I'll remove the hash from here. And now if I go to the browser, okay, we will start seeing some other errors. Okay. Now, okay. We are starting to see some more errors. So it says show speed must be declared in an enclosing class. All right. So what is this error now? Okay. So if you go inside, sure, you have all the references to show speed with like it proceeds with a hash. So I need to delete this. I need to delete it from here as well. Okay. Do you see show speed being used anywhere else? I don't. So I'll hit save and I'll switch over to browser. Okay. And I'll say info. Okay. It still says show speed is not a function. So let me go down. Why is it saying so? Okay. So I have by mistake S as capital over here, which should not be the case. It should be lowercase. Okay. If I save this, it'll work now. So I'll save and I'll press info. You can see the bat mobile is going at zero miles per hour. Okay. Which is perfect. Now our car class has another public member. Okay. If you scroll to the top, you can see like we have speed, which is public and we have name as well, which is also public. So we can mark name as private. That means name can't be accessed from outside the car class. And to do this, we will prefix it with a hash over here as per the convention. Okay. And the moment we do this, okay, we will start to see getting errors over here. You can see. So the error says name must be declared. So it's not declared yet. So what I will do is I will declare it over here. Okay. Like so. And hopefully that should fix the error as well. All right. So now you can see the program needs to use the speed property, which is why it is marked as public over here. Okay. So the speed is being used, I believe outside the class as well. You can see, and that is why it's marked as public. Okay. You can scroll down and see, like you can just select one instance of speed and all the other instance will get highlighted where all the speed is being used. And in visual studio, you can even use these markers. So whenever you highlight anything, so if I highlight I, or if I highlight acceleration factor, you can see these markers here, which will tell you where all acceleration factor is being used. Since I want to check speed, you can see speed is being used at these many places. So you can check and it's being used absolutely outside the class as well. And that is why we need to keep it public. So it's used. If you scroll down, it's being used inside the for loops here, every for loop, in fact, of every case that we have written to decide how many times we need to draw the road. So this is the loop that decides how many times we need to draw the road. And if the car is at a higher speed, like you will see, uh, like road is being drawn multiple times. Okay. And that's how we indicate the speed on the track. So the faster the car is going, the further down the track, it moves each time. Okay. So let us see how it works. So I'll hit save. Okay. I'll switch over to browser. I'll close this. 
okay now remember to accelerate to start the car or it won't go anywhere all right so i'll, I'll press 4 and it's going at 40 miles per hour i can press info okay so i've got an error it says undefined so why is it saying undefined now so let me scroll up let me scroll inside okay so i got the issue here we are referring name as directly name so that should not be the case okay it should be hash name so that is why we were getting undefined so i'll say hash name i'll hit save and now it should work perfectly fine okay so i'll accelerate i'll say four you can see the bat mobile is now going by 40 miles per hour info also gives the same output okay and you can just play around with the car okay and just be careful not to drive off the edges of the track or the car will crash like i'm doing right now and you will see it didn't crash okay but it's a weird behavior right now okay ideally the car should crash or something should happen because i've just driven to the edge of the road okay and this is not good like what is happening on the screen right now is not good okay uh, so we will fix this in the upcoming lecture all right so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss about returning a result from a function and by the end of this lecture you will have a clarity as to how you can return a result from a function or a method and we will be actually modifying our car game code so let's get started so what we are going to do is we are going to see how to write a function that returns a value we have already used functions that return values for example we have get output dev so for example if you scroll down here we have this get output dev and this function returns the element by id after finding it we will start by creating a still on track function and we are going to use it to check that the car hasn't driven off the track i'm going to do something that may seem strange now i'm going to use the function before we have written it we'll get an error of course but this can be a valid technique when programming. The technique is called top-down programming and involves writing code at the high level, then filling in the details later on. The reason I'm using it here is so that we can see how we are going to use the function before we attempt to write the code for it. What we need to do is check that the car is still on track after we move it the code might look something like this so i'll modify so i'll scroll up and here just before draw road i will say i'll press and enter i'll say if still on track so i'll say still on track then i'll say else and i'll have an alert here i'll call this as oops you have crashed game over so i'll say oops you have crashed game over and i'll end this with a semicolon Okay, so seeing how the function is going to be used should help to understand why we wanted to return a value. If the car is still on track, we need it to return true. 
If the car has hit the barrier at one side of the track, the function should return false. We can now start to write the function and I'll put it after accelerate function over here. So I'll say function still on track. Now I'll hit save. So one thing I would like to highlight is you have seen me using the word function and method interchangeably. So function is usually referred to a function that is written outside the class. And a method is a function that is written within the class. So this is a method and this will be a function here. All right. So we want still on track function to return true or false, a Boolean in other words. We define that by specifying the type before the function name. And in this case, the type is Boolean for a Boolean value. You don't have to specify the return type in JavaScript. However, in other programming languages, you have to specify the return type and also that returning value has to match that type else you'll get an error. Okay, what's the function going to do? So, well, we could check if the car position is decreased to less than zero or if it's increased to more than the length of the road string. More than the number of character, in other words, when I say more than the length of the road string. That would work at the moment, but we are planning to improving things later on so that the road curves the game is not very exciting with the straight road. When that happens, the road might curve right while the car is on far left. That would result in the car position still being greater than zero, but to the left of the road boundary. If that doesn't make much sense yet, don't worry. It will make sense when you see the road curving. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to check the character at the position where the car will be inserted. If it's a space, then we are within the two edge markers. So by two edge markers, I mean these edge markers in the road string. And if it's not a space, we have crashed into the one side or the other. We'll talk about this more once we have seen it working. We need the position of car so that we can see what's the position in the string. We also need the string that we are checking. So we have seen functions that take a single argument, but functions can and often do take more than one argument. Here, we need the car's position and the string that defines the road. All right. So what I will do is I'll scroll down and I'll say over here position and I'll say road as well here. We'll add some code here now. Okay, so I'll just press enter and I'll say if position is less than road dot length then and I'll add and so what is the string name? So let me scroll up and let me see. So it's road. Okay. And here we are passing road. So it's a smaller one. So I'll say road dot position is equal to space. Okay. Then you have to return true. We'll write the else block as well else will say return false. Now this is a longhand version of the code that returns the value and that will work. But we know that the condition evaluate to true or false. Okay. Either of both. If the condition on the line here will be either true or false, we can just return the result of evaluating the condition. So what I can do is I can actually comment this code 
and I can just copy this condition here or in fact let me copy entirely so I'll copy it with the parenthesis and I'll say return now we have done exactly the same thing but more concisely that's how you will normally find code like this return because we are not using if the extra parenthesis around the corner is redundant so I can simply remove this from here if you prefer to leave them in that's fine they are not going to do any harm but I'll remove them now what we need to do is we need to pass the arguments to our still on track function so we are using still on track over here and I need to pass arguments like car position comma road now I'll hit save and you can run the program to make sure that it works I'll press the accelerate button to accelerate I'll say 4 and I'll okay it's going at 40 miles per hour and I'll go towards the left and once we crash we get a message oops you have crashed game over okay so okay we have crashed onto the left so it works very well okay we have seen the game over message as well so that's about this class guys I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how can you check if your car is still on track and we built this functionality by understanding and concept as to how methods or functions can return values and we actually created a function still on track which returns boolean result and we use that result to evaluate an expression and make decision. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss how duplicating code is bad. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity on this concept with the help of some example. So let's get started. So there are lots of improvements we can make to our this car game and we will be doing that as we learn how to do more. There is one issue that I'm not sure you have spotted. So here we are not breaking out of the loop after we have crashed the car. Okay, ideally we should. So what we are going to do is we are going to add a break over here. So I'll say break semicolon. Now we are only checking for a crash when the car goes left, not when it's going right or straight ahead. I am now going to do something that should ring alarm bells if you find yourself doing it. We want to do exactly the same thing that the code here does. So basically this code here, we want to do the exact same thing when the car is moving right and when it's moving straight. So we'll use it to replace the calls to draw road method here down. So here like within this for loop, I will copy this entire thing here. So we want to do this exact same thing. So I'll just copy this. And here I'll paste it. I'll just remove this because we don't want to decrease the car position because we are just going straight. I'll scroll down as well. Here we need to even do the same thing over here okay for car going right so i'll paste it here as well 
and instead of minus minus i'll just increment this okay because we are going to the right so if you find yourself copy pasting a block of code then consider whether it may be better to create a function instead if you paste it more than once as we have done here then there's probably no doubt that it should be in a function but it's always a good idea to test that something works before improving it so i'll just save the program and let's run it okay so i'll just go to the browser here and i'll hit refresh i'll accelerate i'll accelerate to the maximum 9 90 hours 90 miles per hour sorry i'll say left and i'll say right and it's working fine i'll say info it's working fine and straight is also working fine so left right straight everything is working fine so now i suggest you to run program a couple of times to make sure that it still crashes on the left hand side okay so it crashed okay and i won't test the right side okay like i have already tested it and it worked at my end so you can test it at your end okay and it should look good okay or i'll just refresh it and i'll test it so i'll say nine and i'll go right right and you can see it crashed fair enough so it's looking good but what isn't looking good is all the duplicated code in the drive function if you want to change the crash message or print something like an asterisk to represent a crash then we would have to make the change in three places here like you can see if there is a bug in this code then we would have to remember it to fix in three places so it's cumbersome to maintain this but in the next video or in the next lecture we will move all this code into its own function and before you watch the next lecture examine the code carefully and think about which values we'll need to pass to the function as its argument also consider whether it will need to return a value or not so that's about this class guys in this lecture we learned how duplicating code is bad and we learned very well with the help of an example in our car game so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to refactor our code to remove the duplicate code and in this lecture you are going to learn how can you refactor the code and this will be a great exercise for you as well wherein you are modifying and improving an already existing code base so let's get started so our goal is to remove the duplicate code blocks from each of the switch case labels here as you can see so changing the structure of a program without changing what it does is known as refactoring you can't just jump in and start moving stuff around though you have to think about it we know that we want to move that code into its own method that's repeated twice lower down and the code we are moving uses the car speed to decide how many times to go into the loop and you can see over here this so it's using car speed here that's one argument that we need to pass to the method the method or the function also needs to know the starting position of the car so the car position will be another argument here now the value of the road is a class constant and that's available everywhere all those constants that are declared 
outside the function like over here are available throughout all right okay so we could let our new function access road directly over here that will work so we will do that we are going to have to change it later but we'll see why when we do it so we have identified two arguments that our method or function will need so a function so since we are defining it outside the class it will be function okay so i'll say function and the name is let's drive all right and i'll have your parameters over here so i'll say speed and position all right now i can cut all the code okay so i'll just cut this code here this entire piece from here so this is the for block so i can just cut this entire thing here okay and i'll move this into the let's drive function here so here we are still referring to car position so here as well as here as well as over here so we need to use position over here and not the car position okay so since we are passing that as the parameter okay so what we will be doing is we will rename this we will rename this as position same over here and same over here and we are also referring to batmobile.speed over here wherein we are only supposed to use the argument which is speed so i'll just delete this part now you may have noticed that we have missed something very important if you haven't spotted check out this line over here okay i've highlighted it over here so have a think about this line and we will fix it later but for now i'll use the let's try function okay over here so i'll say let's try and i'll just call let's try wherein i'll say batmobile dot speed and i'll say car position here it seems like we left a open bracket over here so we need to add that over here okay so that is it i will delete this empty line here so now what we can do is we will save this program and we will run in our browser so i'll switch over to our browser refresh first i'll accelerate i'll say 6 and we'll accelerate to 60 miles per hour i'll press left a few times okay straight left 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 okay so there's something going wrong very wrong and to describe that as a understeer would be an understatement a car won't go left properly so if you press it press left straight left left so you will see that it's not going left and there's a reason for that and it has to do with how we are passing car position to let's drive function here okay so this function this parameter here so i'll leave you to test the brakes cause you are going to need them and in the upcoming lecture we will look at what's causing the problem and what value and reference parameters are all right so i hope you guys had fun refactoring the code and removing the duplicate code we have some issues which will get fixed soon so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture we are going to discuss the problem that we have got. Okay, 
So we know we have got a problem and luckily we tested the drive method before we changed all the case sections. By doing that, we know that the problem is somehow caused by using the method. The same code to go to the right in the switch still works, right? So you can check this. Often, once you have had a plenty of practice, you can spot bugs by reading the code. In the early days, you might use the debugger to work out what's going wrong. In this case, the debugger won't tell us anything that our eyes aren't already telling us. I'll run the program again. So here in the browser, I'll accelerate. I'll say seven, I'm at 70 and I'll click left a few times and you will see like a car is not going left and it just starts from the original position. Although its position is changing inside the let's drive method, it's getting reset when we get back to where we call it. We can see that on the screen, but if you want to run the debugger to check, you will find that car position over here is always 15. So the car position is always 15. The reason for that is we are not passing the variable car position into the drive function. We are just passing its value. That value is passed and the value is available inside drive as the local variable position over here. But changing the position doesn't alter the value of car position. That's an important point and the one that new programmers often find difficult. And hopefully this visual demonstration has made it a bit clear. So here on this particular line, when we call let's drive function, this variable is not passed into let's drive function, but its value is passed. The technical term for that is to say the argument is passed by value. Okay, if that is true, then this, for example, so if I pass 15 instead of car position, should give exactly the same behavior. And I'll run the program again. I'll accelerate. I'll accelerate to seven and left. You can see it's the same behavior that we are seeing here. And that explains why the argument doesn't change even though the variable position is being changed down the line. So you can see it being changed down the line here. The original argument is now 15 and you can't change the value of 15. 15 is always 15. If our drive function had somehow managed to make 15 become eight, the entire physical universe would collapse. And if that wasn't bad though, your paychecks would shrink to nearly half of what they are. The 15 value is passed by value. If that makes sense, then I'll undo the change that we have done over here. Okay. So it makes sense that car position is also passed by value. JavaScript evaluates car position and then passes the value to the drive function. The current value of car position is 15 because that's what we initialized it to. In JavaScript, primitive values like Boolean string numbers are all passed by value by default and object types are passed by reference. We still have to fix this issue and let's see how this issue can be fixed in the upcoming lectures. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what the issue is now and we will be fixing this soon. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you.
Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss how can you make use of global variables. So let's get started. We have seen so far that arguments are passed by value. That's the default mechanism for primitive types. JavaScript evaluates the variable and sends the value to the method we are calling. Most of the time, that's exactly what we want, which is why it's the default behavior. Sometimes we do want to change the variables that we pass as an argument. Generally, that should be avoided. It makes the code harder to read and maintain because the methods have side effects. I'll talk about that in a moment. First, let's see how we can modify the car position value. The first change is to our let's drive method. So our let's drive function here. So the first change to our let's drive function declaration here. So we will have to remove the parameter position. And that is something that I'm going to do. So I've removed that. All right. Now, we already have a global variable defined, which is car position. Let's use this variable inside the function so that the actual position value is reflected and used across the program. The next change is to use a global variable inside the drive method. Sorry, not method, but function instead of using a local variable. So I'm going to change position to car position here, here. All right. And I'm going to copy this and paste it here. So we don't have position, but we have car position now. And then I'll scroll down here and I'll remove the car position as the variable. Now that we have done that, car position will be updated by let's drive function and our code should work. Let's run the program and use accelerate. So I'll save the code. I'll head over to the browser. Okay, I'll go live here. I'll start the server. Here and I'll click accelerate. I will accelerate by eight, let's say it's going at 80 miles per hour. Okay. Let's click left, straight, right. This seems to be working. But if I go to extreme left, if I click it twice, I get a message. Oops, you have crashed game over. So this time only the car crashes Our code doesn't. We have fixed the problem in the process. In the process, we learned the difference between passing by value and passing by reference. Okay, so we have got duplicate code in our case selection right now for straight and right here, as you can see. And we have got to fix that. We have to use the let's try function now. All right. That's about this class guys. So I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how can you fix this issue with the use of global variable. So that's about this class. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss a refactoring challenge. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what you're supposed to do in this challenge and what are the things that you're supposed to keep in mind. So let's get started. So before we have a challenge to refactor the other two cases, there's a problem with our let's drive function. So let's take a look over here and have a look at this line here. The position is decreased each time you go around the loop, okay? Which means the let's drive function 
can only go left. What we need to do is we need to add minus one to go left, zero to go straight and one to go right. So I'll rewrite this line, remembering that adding minus one is same as subtracting minus one. All right. So what I will be doing is I will say car position and I'll say car position minus one here. So I've rephrased the calculation over here. All right. So this is done and this will still go left, but it shouldn't be too hard to pass another parameter to the function to tell it what value to add to the position. Okay. So your challenge is to continue refactoring the code to remove the duplicate code from the straight and right case selection. Also make the necessary changes to the let's drive function so that it works when going straight and right. And try this challenge guys, and I will attempt the solution. I'll, I'll show you the solution in the upcoming lecture. Meanwhile, you should try it out and then check the solution. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the solution to the refactoring challenge. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what are the changes you need to make sure in your code so that your car game works perfectly. So how did you get on? There aren't too many ways to do this. So your solution should look much like mine. The first step for this challenge is to add up another parameter to let's try function here. So the parameter will be, so I'll call the parameter as direction. Okay. Direction at the moment, this function can only go left. So with the help of this direction parameter, we will be able to go left straight and right. So I'll just delete this and I'll add direction over here. Okay. Now, if we want to go left, we will pass minus one passing zero will go straight and passing one will go right. All right. So we might get an error if we save this file because we are not passing anything yet, but I'll start passing the values here. So I'll pass minus one for left. Then I'll simply copy this and here, okay, I'll just delete this and I'll add zero and I'll delete things here as well and I'll add one. Now let's drive function can go in all three direction. And after replacing all the code in each of the case section, okay, we can save the file. Okay. So I'll just save it. And it's also now very less of code. And we also have clarity as to what each case sections are doing without having to read the same for loop over and over again. You may have used constants for those three values to make the code even more readable. In fact, something called an enum might be more appropriate than constants. And we will be coming back to this code when we have seen what an enum is. But for now, I will declare three constants so I can scroll up here. All right. I can copy this. And I'll say here, I'll say directions. And I'll say direction left.
So direction left is minus one. I'll just duplicate this line then. So it's straight then. And straight is zero. And then we have right. And right is one. Perfect. So we have three constants now and you can scroll down here and you can say direction left. So like this direction left direction straight and then direction right. Fair enough. It's much more cleaner. All right. So if you haven't used constants, that's absolutely fine. They are not essential here, but when I use them, it's much cleaner what those numbers are here for. So you clearly know that those numbers are to set the direction. I won't test the program on the video. I'm sure you don't want to watch me driving down the track when you can have so much fun doing it yourself. Okay, so I'm going to leave our car game here. There are still some improvements to be made to the code. The car symbol, for example, should probably be a field in our car class. Arguably, the car position should also belong inside the class. At the moment, if we had more than one car, they would all be in the same place. That's going to dent the bodywork a bit. So that's one change we will look at when we cover classes in more detail in the later sections of the course. The track is also a bit boring and we can improve that. But first we will need to learn about arrays and also reading data from the file. Once we have covered those topics, we can make our track curve and have a more interesting game. So in the upcoming lectures, we will refactor the Bitcoin miners code in the Hammer Bitcoin project. Okay. And that will give us a practice at working with methods and also a chance to discuss variable scope. So that's about this lecture guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity on the challenge solution and how you can make the car game work. All right. So I'll just remove this unwanted space from here. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss variable scope. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what this means and what are we going to do going forward with our hammer Bitcoin project. So let's get started. So for this video, we are going to start taking an another look at our Bitcoin miner code in the hammer Bitcoin project. So if you remember the programmer who wrote this code was fired. Well, not really. I don't want to give you the impression that you will get fired for making a few mistakes in your code. But when we first saw this code, I'll just open up the file. So I'll go to hammer Bitcoin, Bitcoin miner .js. So when we first saw this code, I wanted to make it clear that it had problems. We put the mistakes in deliberately so that we could discuss them and learn from them in this course. It was important that you didn't think it was perfect though and do something similar in your own programs. We are going to examine this code more carefully and have a look at some things that can be improved. In the process, we will learn about the scope of variables. Sounds good. So let's get started. 
right at the top of Bitcoin miner class. So I'll scroll up at the top. Here you can see a lot of variables being declared. Now variables declared as at the class level like these are called fields. I've used that term before because they are declared here in the class itself rather than inside the method. They are available from anywhere inside the class. Their scope is the entire class and that's what scope means. Now, as I said, these variables are available everywhere in the Bitcoin miner class. If we would declare them to be public instead of private, they would also be available outside the class, for example. So, however, making fields public is going against the principles of object oriented programming. I mentioned making them public to explain what that would do to their scope, but you should almost never make a field public. Okay. If these fields are available everywhere inside the class, that means we can assign new values to them anywhere in the class and we do. So double click on the cache field. Okay. So we have selected cache here. All right. Now scroll down. Okay. And you will see like it has been changed in the play method over here. Then scroll down further. It has been changed. Okay. It has not been changed. It has been referred over here, but it has been changed over here within by computers method. And again on cell computers, and again in pay employees and so on. So I haven't finished. It is also changed here at the bottom here in maintain computers and so on. So there are a lot of places where this field has been assigned a new value. Is that a problem? Well, no. And yes. It's certainly valid to change the value of fields in your class methods, but doing so excessively can make it very hard to maintain the code. To see why it can cause problems, let's have a look at the play method here at the top. Okay. So here we have this play method at the top. And we have used the informative names for various methods. And it's easy to see that this code does things like printing summary, buying computers, sell computers, paying employees and maintain computers as well. Lots of stuff that is being done in this single method. And now we know like at the top here, cash starts off with a value of 2800. But reading through this code here, do you have any idea what the value of cash will be when it gets to this line, for example, any idea here? So by reading, you won't have any idea. Okay. So if you scroll down here, we are using cash. So do you have any idea what will be the value over here? No. So this particular line adds the amount of Bitcoin's mind. And that's the only place where the cache is mentioned in this method. But reading that code, there's absolutely no indication that cache would be anything other than 2800. The first time round this loop. Worst, reading the code can give you the impression that the value of cache only ever increases. Okay, since the this particular line number 68 adds Bitcoin's mind to the cash and there is nothing to indicate that the cash can reduce. Admittedly, cash is something that we are all familiar with. We might expect that buying computers is going to reduce our cash. 
What if it was using the Avogadro's constant to calculate the volume of gas in a hot air balloon? Okay, you may be a physical chemist and understand it all perfectly, but the next programmer who has to maintain the code might not. As programmers, we could end up working on a code to do all sorts of things. All of those methods we saw while I was scrolling through the code looking for cache have side effects. When method is said to have side effects, that means it does things apart from returning a value. Side effects are sometimes unavoidable, but we can and we should take steps to minimize them. If we can't remove them completely, then we could make them explicit. So let us see how can we minimize the side effects and I'll talk about this in the upcoming lectures as well. So that's all for this lecture guys. In this lecture, we understood about variable scope. We discussed a bit about variable scope and also how our code has possible side effects. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to start discussing and actually implementing the removal of side effects. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how side effects can be removed from this code in Bitcoin miner. So let's get started. We finished the last video by discussing side effects in methods. One of them is the by computer methods. So if you take a look over here, the by computer methods. So I'll press control and I'll, you, you'll see this being converted into a hyperlink. If you press and hold control, if I click on this, I'll straight away be taken to by computers. So this method has side effects. It modifies computers and cache, as you can see over here. So here it modifies cache and computers as well. We can improve it, but do we re really need to modify the computers field? We have to provide cache because the method uses that to make sure that player can afford all the computers they want to buy. Plus, we also modify the value of cash. But what are we doing with computers? The answer is we are not doing anything with it that couldn't be done at the call site. The call site, by the way, is the point in the code where the methods called. In other words, it is the location in the source code where a method is called. Okay, so instead of using field directly in the method by computers, what if we just remove that side effect instead? Let's see how to do that. We can just return the number of computers to buy. And I'll do that, but it will have to be done after we print the messages because a return statement exits the method straight away. So we are printing some messages over here. Okay. On the console, I'll add a return statement over here. So I'll say return computers to buy. All right. So I'm doing this here. We are now returning a value from the method. The method now only has one side effect. It only modifies the cache. Let us also add a parameter number of computers. So I'll add a parameter over here. Number of computers. All right. Back up in the play method, we could use that return value to modify the number of computers and we'll pass the computers value to the method. All right. So let's go at the top here. 
So here I'll say let computers to buy. All right. Now that's now a lot more readable. We are increasing the number of computers by the number that the player buys. And it's also obvious that our cache is affected. In the buy computers method, okay, so I'll go in the buy computers method here. We are here modifying the value of computers. Yeah, over here. But here we are updating the computers instance variable. Okay, so we have to make updates here. All right. So what I will be doing is I will be updating this line to so I'll say number of computers is equal to number of computers plus computers to buy. Okay. Now if you scroll up in the play method, like line 50, the line which I've selected, it is obvious that computer may be increased. Okay, computers may be increased if the player buys more computer, we can also tell that the cache may be changed, which isn't surprising. If the player does buy some more computers. Alright. Here we can pass the parameter. So I can say this dot computers over here. Okay. And this will go as the parameter. All right. Now here on the next line, what we can do is since we have the number of computers to buy, we can say this dot computers is equal to this dot computers plus computers to buy. This looks good. Okay. There are a still couple of things I'm not happy about in the buy computers method. Okay. But as they are not related to the scope, I'm going to ignore them for now. Okay. Now what I can do is I'll go to buy computers method here. Okay. And here, so we are adding the number of computers. Okay. Here and I'll copy this. And I will display the value over here. Okay. And then we don't need this line. So we were updating this value over here and we were displaying it. So we were updating the value of this dot computers instance over here and we were displaying it over here. But now we don't need to do this. We can just return the computers to buy from here. Okay. And we can actually then update the value in the play method itself. Okay. And here just for the sake of displaying, we can just add like we can just add the computers to buy to number of computers and just show it to the user. All right. So I've commented this line here. Okay, because uh, I'm not deleting it so that you have got its reference, I'll delete it later on. But I think this looks much more cleaner and doesn't give the impression that we want to change anything. One thing I would like to highlight here is whatever variables that are being defined inside the function are only accessible within the function and not outside. For example, we have question variable being created over here inside the by computers method. This is only accessible inside by computers method and not outside. We have covered a lot in this video now and the previous one as well. I suggest you watch them a few times to fully understand the concepts we discussed. It's hard to take everything in the first time, especially if you have been typing the code in while watching. But I'm going to summarize the main points in the upcoming lectures because next lecture also has a challenge. And you can probably guess what's that going to be. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we did some refactoring to the Bitcoin miner class and we tried removing some side effects. Okay. I hope you guys have a 
fair clarity as to how you can make it work for the rest of the code as well. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to summarize the learnings from the scope. Okay, and we are going to be introduced to a new challenge. So let's get started. In the last few lectures, we have looked at removing side effects in our methods. We also saw how to make them explicit if we don't want to remove them. So one result was that here in the play method. So if you scroll up. So in the play method, we prevented by computers method from modifying a class property computer and also made it obvious that it had a side effect of possibly modifying cache. I also introduced the term call site. So here, this particular line, which you're seeing highlighted is the call site for the by computers method whenever we need them. The term call site refers to anywhere that a method is called. We completely removed the side effect of by computers method that modifies the computer's property. We have talked about the scope of properties. The scope is the entire class where they've declared. I've also introduced to the term global variables, a variable whose scope is global. It's quite a loose term because it doesn't say global to what. If we would have made our properties public, they would be global to the entire project, not just the Bitcoin miner class. But it's a common term and you will find it being used. Global variables are not necessarily bad. I'll rephrase that global variables are evil. Sometimes they are necessary, but you should try only use them where they are necessary. One example is class properties. When you want to expose their value to users of the class, as soon as you add a property to a class, there is no escaping the fact that its scope will be entire class. Another thing we saw was that the parameter name don't conflict with all with other variable names that may be in the scope when the method is executed. When you declare a method or when you declare a parameter in the method, the name you use becomes local to the method. If there happens to be another variable with the same name in the enclosing scope, the JavaScript doesn't care. The other programmers reading the code may get confused. So it can be a good idea to rename parameters when you refactor the method. So here, if you go to the by computers method, you can see the scope of this variable number of computers is only within this method and not outside this method. All right. I also noted that properties should very rarely be made public. We will talk more about that when we come to take a look at the classes in more detail. Most of the properties in the Bitcoin miner class probably shouldn't even be properties. They should probably be variables that are local to play method. This code still needs a fair bit of refactoring. A lot of time, the code can be refactored to remove the side effect completely. We did that with computers in the by computers method. We saw how to refactor a method so that it uses parameters instead of accessing the global variables. This makes the code more robust and easier to read. And that brings me nicely to our challenge. So the challenge is to refactor the Bitcoin miner class to remove all the side effects that you can from the methods. The first step is to identify the side effects. 
if you can't completely remove a side effect in cases where a method modifies more than one field then remove just one side effect don't worry about converting fields into local variables i'll cover that after we have dealt with the side effects so have a go and i'll show you my solution in the upcoming lecture so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity on these concepts and i hope you guys have a fair clarity on the challenge as well so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss the solution to the challenge so you may have found this challenge a bit harder than the earlier ones but refactoring code like this is a great way to practice and make sure you understand the topics covered in the videos before i begin there was a line of code that we were going to delete and we had commented it out in the by computers method okay so so i'll remove this line for now okay we don't need this okay so going on with the challenge the first method to refactor is the cell computers this is very similar to by computers it's going to need the computer's price so that it can display the correct price we'll pass in computers so that the method can print out the total number of computers after more have been bought so i'll say computer's price computers so we have two parameters now next i'll scroll down over here somewhere over here and i'll delete this calculation here okay and i'll display the value over here in the like while displaying it on the console so i'll say you have computers minus computers to sell and then we will return the computers to sell so i'll say return computers to sell all right so we have made the necessary modifications we are now not modifying the computers i would also say we probably don't need the computers price so i'll just remove it for now okay we are not modifying it for now and if i scroll up here we will scroll up to the play method so here's the play method and here you have sell computers so i'll say let computers to sell and what i will be doing is i will be modifying the computers to sell so i'll be saying this dot computers so is equal to this dot computers minus computers to sell so we have updated the value of computers and we need to pass in this dot computers so this is the computer value there you go so this should work but i'm not going to spend time testing it on the video i strongly advise you to test your code after each step though that way if you have introduced a bug it will be much more obvious where it's likely to be if you refactor working code and it no longer works then the bug will be in the bits of code that you changed the sooner you spot the bug the less code you will have to examine to find the cause moving on the next method is the play employees sorry not play employees it's pay employees so i can hold control and i can click and i'll immediately navigate 
to the method. Now this one is a bit simpler because it uses only one field cache here. Once again, I'll pass cache as the parameter here and return the cash being paid to the employees. So I'll say return cash paid to employees. Notice that method doesn't use the value of cash paid to the employees and it's updating it over here. Okay. So what we will be doing is we will be introducing a new local variable over here. So I'll say let cash pay to employees here like so. I will comment this line here and here I'll update it to cash minus cash pay to employees. All right. And also we can update this. This will be cash paid to the employees. All right. Or we'll keep it to the original value because we are doing a comparison over here. All right. So this looks good. Okay. And uh, I'm returning this. Okay. So I have to return this value. All right. So, so far so good. What I'm going to do now is I will head over to my play method over here. Yep. And here I'm going to update or I'm going to get the return value. So I'm going to say let cash paid to employees. And then I will use this. So I'll say cash is equal to cash minus cash paid to the employees. So far so good. And it looks much cleaner now. Okay. So if you notice, we didn't modify the value of cash in the method, but instead we used the returned value to update the cash over here. Everything else is just more of the same. If you struggle with the challenge, have a go at refactoring the remaining code, maintain computers, and I'll continue the solution in the next lecture. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to continue over our solution. And after pay employees, maintain computers is the next method that we are going to alter. This is very similar to buying and selling computers, but has a number of tests. Now these tests use cash, computers and employees field. I'll pass computers and employees as arguments. So I'll scroll up, I'll say computers, employees. So these are the arguments. Cash will be updated by the method and will return the number of computers maintained. The field computers maintained is also modified. So if you scroll down over here, okay, we will be creating a variable computers maintained. So I'll just delete this part and I'll say let computers maintained. Okay. And what I will be doing is I will be removing this dot computer maintained and I'll be referring it to computers maintained. Okay. And I will be returning the computers maintained. Okay, if you scroll up, let us go through the method code now here. If you see, we have maintain output, the maintenance amount, where we are initializing this variable, okay. 
we are using cache over here, which is fine. Here we are using this dot computers. So I need to update. I'll say computers over here. Okay, and instead of this dot computers, I'll say computers again. Then I'll scroll down here. We are using employees, this dot employees. So I'll just refer this to the parameter. Same over here as well. And here at the bottom, we have created another variable computers maintained. And we have modified the cache and returned computers maintained. So far so good. Okay, I don't think we need to do any more changes. Now our programmer also wrote a note over here that the statement can be return, uh, written as or rewritten as this. And that's the good suggestion because the code in the comment is slightly more efficient. The value of cache only has to be evaluated once rather than twice with the current code. Okay, so what I will be doing is I can like just take this code. Okay, I can just copy it or rather than copying, I can just make changes over here itself. So I can say minus over here and I can just delete this part. We have usual changes in the play method. So I'll just scroll up here. And here you have maintain computers. Okay. So you can say computers. So I'll just, so you can say computers maintained. Okay. And you can hit save. So this is a variable that we have already declared. Okay. So that's the first part of the challenge completed. Now let me scroll down. Okay. So, so we have computers maintained, we have check for crash. So, so check for crash method doesn't have any side effects. It has no arguments and already returns a value. It does use employees field though. Okay. So you can see over here, it uses employees field. We can remove that reliance on a global variable by passing employees as an argument. So I'll add a parameter. I'll say employees and we'll use that parameter over here. Looks good. And if we scroll up, we will have to pass this as an argument over here, market crash. So, so check for crash will have hashtag employees. Okay. And this looks good. Now we have one more method, like we have count starved employees. So I'll scroll down here. Okay. Now count starved employee. We need to add cash paid to employees. Okay. So I'll add cash paid to employees over here. And then I will remove all the references to cash paid to the employees, like you can see. So one reference is over. Okay. So one reference is over here, as you can see. So I'll just zoom out a bit and this is the one I'll update this. You have a reference here as well. And then there are no references. So it all looks good. Okay. Now what I can do is I'm, I'm re already returning percentage staffed. So this looks good. And I think that's the only change we need to make over here. So I'll scroll up here, count staffed employees, and I'll just return cash paid to the employees. And that's the challenge completed. So it's given you a practice at passing the arguments by value. This code needs a lot more refactoring, but that's enough to be getting on with for now. It's possible to pass a variable number of arguments to a method, and we will leave that for later in the course. 
so that is the end of this section okay and i hope you guys enjoyed this class and the challenge and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to summarize this section this section is the last of the three sections covering flow control in the last section we looked at looping using for while and do while this section covered ways to test conditions and execute different blocks of code depending on the result we used if else and switch to decide what code should be executed we learned how to use the debugger to step into a method and check the flow of execution when we call a method and when it returns parameters and arguments are precise terms and technical documentation uses them in a specific way a parameter is declared as a part of method declaration and effectively creates a local variable that can be used in the method when you call a method you provide arguments for each of the parameters when the code in the method starts executing the parameters have the value of the arguments that we passed in i don't think i mentioned this but programmers often use the two terms interchangeably when talking that's not strictly correct but we all talk differently to how we write we declare a parameter and we pass an argument i'll try to always use the correct term but if i slip up you'll know why we used what we have learned from the earlier sections to write a simple car game that gave us a chance to look at public and private members in more detail we saw that private methods and fields are only available inside the class where they are declared whereas public members can be used outside the class the use of public and private methods in our game is something that we have looked at in this section as well we created a method that returns a value and saw that the return statement causes a method to terminate and return to the code that called it while doing that i mentioned top down programming it's a valid technique and involves a method before you have written the code for it of course the program won't work until you do write it but it can help when working out how your class or method will work refactoring means changing how code works without changing what it does programmers often refactor code because the original code is difficult to maintain but it's also done when converting code from one language to another the new language may have features that the original one lacked in javascript primitive types are passed by value the method gets the value of the argument and can't change the variable that was passed in a car game contained duplicate code which generally isn't a good idea we used a method to let us call the duplicated code from the different points in the program we looked at the scope of variables in the hammer bitcoin project we talked about global variables and removing the side effects i also introduced the term call site and it means the point in the code where a method is called from so that's about this section guys 
I hope you guys enjoyed this section and found it super valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So we are going to do an introduction to this section. We have covered a lot so far and I'm sure you are still confused, but I'm also sure that you are a lot less confused than you were when you started this course. Most, if not all of the code in Bitcoin miner class should now make sense. There is quite a bit in Eliza in doctor class that probably doesn't make sense. That program does a lot of work with strings and we are going to look at some of the string methods in the next section. We have been using arithmetic operators a lot and haven't really discussed them in detail. I'll start this section by doing just that. We will have a look at the operators that are available and also discuss operator precedence. So that's what we are going to cover in this section, guys. I am very excited to start teaching this section and I hope you guys are excited too to learn. So let's get started. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss operators and their precedence. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity. What are operators that you can use? How can you use them in JavaScript? And we are going to take a look at this concept of operator precedence. So let's get started. It's usual to discuss operators right at the start of a programming course. They are pretty fundamental and you can't do much without them. Discussing them is also like being back at the school. On their own, they are a bit boring. So I'll keep this short, but let's go back to school. So what I would request you all to do is, I would request you all to close all the open files and create a new folder over here in the project explorer and call it operators. Here is where we will be writing all the code. We need to add a main.js and index.js. So I'll just copy these two files from here and I'll paste it over here. I'll clear the main.js and there you go. So this looks better now. I'll just reduce the width of this. Okay, so far so good. So what we'll be doing is we will be writing some code over here. Okay, so I'll say let answer is equal to seven plus three into four. And I'll end this with a semicolon. And then I'll say console dot log and we'll print the answer. So here in this statement, we are using plus to perform the addition over here. And we are using asterisk to perform the multiplication, right? So the answer we will get is 19 or 40. So seven plus three is 10 and four times 10 is 40. Alternatively, adding seven to the result of three times the four will give you 19. It's obvious that if we got different results, depending on what mood our computer was in, then the modern world would fall apart. Being charged $40 for an online order that should cost $19 would be bad enough. But you would also have no idea where your aeroplane would land if you tried to fly somewhere. There has to be rules so that this expression always evaluates to the same value on all computers. The rules are called operator precedence. And 
they define the order that expressions are evaluated in in our example the rules of operator precedence mean that the multiplication is performed first so what we will do is we will run the program so i'll run this with the live server we have it open here and let me inspect over here so here you can see we are seeing 19 being printed so after running the program we get the answer as 19th and in our example the rules of operator precedence mean that the multiplication is performed first now that will be same on any browser executing javascript code it's not necessarily the same in all computer languages a language called smalltalk would produce the answer 40 for example some languages don't use precedence at all they use parentheses in instead i mentioned that because it's a useful technique if you are ever not sure about the precedence of various operators in a complex expression then just use brackets so something like this is what i mean now if i save okay now you will see the output here is changed to 40 now okay So that's one technique for making sure that the things evaluate in the order you want. Here, seven plus three is evaluated first into four is 40, okay? Now you can ignore the rest of the section, okay? Not really, I'm just joking. So understanding operator precedence is extremely important. Even fairly simple expressions won't make sense if you don't understand the relative precedence of the operators. In the next few videos, we will look at a selection of JavaScript operators and what their precedence is. So in this lecture, we discussed and understood about operators in JavaScript and the importance of operator precedence. We got int introduced to this concept and learned about its importance. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about operators in JavaScript. We are going to understand what are the different operators along with their precedence. So let's get started. So I'll switch over to my browser first and we will take a look at the JavaScript guide here. So here, this particular guide is the ECMAScript guide and it lists down all the operators. It breaks down all the operators into various categories. Okay, so you can see over here, left-hand side expressions, unary operators, you can click here you can see exponential operator and so on. Okay, so there are quite a few operators that you can go through over here. There is one more link that I would want to share with you all. And this is the link of developer.mozilla.org. And here you can see different operators and you can click over here on the right hand side to the table and you will be taken down over here and you can see the operator precedence table. Now there are operators that are not advanced are obvious. For example, the first one here after grouping, there is member access. Okay. That's just the dot notation as you can see, and it is evaluated before JavaScript tries to perform any arithmetic on it. Okay, so let me give you an example. So I'll switch over to our, our IDE, not browser, I'm sorry. So 
here in the IDE, let me create a variable here. So I'll create a variable called let radius is equal to 12. And we'll say let area is equal to. So we will be calculating area using the radius. Okay, and this is the area of a circle. So area of circle is pi r square. And for that, we need the value of pi and the value of pi is stored in this math namespace so i can say math dot pi okay into radius into radius so this is pi into radius into radius okay so this is the formula now it is obvious that the value of pi over here from the math namespace Space has to be retrieved before anything can be done with it. Then we have computed member access, which simply means that the value needs to be computed before it's evaluated. Okay. So if you head over to the operator precedence table, you have computer computed member access. Okay. And then you have the new operator. Now new operator simply means that something needs to be created before it's evaluated, like object creation. Next one is also obvious, like you can't do anything with a value that a method returns until you call the method. And the fancy term function call just means calling the method or a function. We have used postfix increment postfix de decrement operator a few times scrolling down to the unary operator section. JavaScript also has prefix increment like you can see over here and prefix decrement as you can see over here. Strictly speaking postfix operators x plus plus. So here you can see the postfix operator. These are the postfix operators. So this postfix operators are also unary operators. Likewise, prefix are also unary, like you can see here. And a unary operator. So what is a unary operator first of all? So unary operator is an operator that has only one operand. Okay. They are very similar and the difference between them is quite subtle. In fact, I would suggest you avoid using them in expressions. They are basically operators with side effects and we know that we should avoid side effects. So let us see some examples and prepare to be confused. So we'll head over to our ID. Now here in the IDE, I'll press enter here a few times and I'll I'll just expand this. Okay, I'm sorry. So I'll just expand this a bit. Okay, so that we have a better view here. I'll say so I'll just comment this first. And here I'll say let x equal to three. And let y is equal to x plus plus. And I'll say console dot log. Okay, and I'll use backticks and I'll say using x plus plus x is dollar x and y is dollar y. All right, so far so good. So you have written this, so we have created two variables. Okay. And then we have printed the value using console.log. Okay. So the value of X is we are printing the value of X before using X plus plus and Y is Y that is being printed, which is after using X plus plus. So before I run that, have a think about what would you expect? the values of X and Y to B when they are printed out and I'll run the program. I'll hit save 
and you can see x is 4 and y is 3. So if you worked out that x would be 4 and y would still be 3 then well done. Let us try that with a prefix increment operator. Okay. So what I will do is I'll just copy this code. I'll paste it over here and here instead of X. So instead I'll just remove this let keyword here. It's redundant. Okay. And instead of this, I'll have a prefix one. Okay. And I'll say plus plus over here and I'll remove this. Now this is the same code but we are using plus plus x instead of x plus plus. Once again, try to work out what the values will be before I run the program. Okay, I'll save this and we see the output. The x is four and y is four. So this time both x and y are four. It gets worse just in case you are not already, con already confused enough. I'll paste some more code over here. So I'll press enter and I'll paste it over here. Okay. So you can see over here, I've pasted this line from here till here. And I'm not going to ask you to work out what X and Y will be after each of these expressions have been evaluated. They would, that would be too mean. In both the cases, X will end up with the value of phi, that's the easy bit. X is incremented twice. So once over here and another time over here. It started off with the value three. So it's not surprising that it ends up with the value five after each line executes. But what about Y? I'll just run the program to find it out. So I'll just hit save. Okay. And Okay, so you are seeing the output here. Did you see those results coming? And you can see the output and check the value of Y. So I'll strongly advise you not to write code like this, like using minus and plus plus in an expression, something like this. Okay, and even like this. And in the next video, in the next lecture, in fact, you will see what really happened in that code. All right. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we discussed about operators in JavaScript along with some of their precedents. And I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how operators in JavaScript work and what are the things you're supposed to keep in mind when using prefix and postfix increment and decrement operators. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to understand more about the code we have written. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity for the best practices when using these operators. So let's get started. So we'll take a look at the code that we have written in the last lecture and try to work out why we got the results we did. So I have modified this code slightly. I have removed the commented out examples from the last video and have added the output for the comment remaining code as comments. So you can see over here, this is the output so that it's easy to refer and understand what's happening. So I'll start with this line over here. The postfix increment operator is being used here and this operator is written by putting plus plus after the variable. X plus plus in this case, okay, that is, that is how it's being used. It increments the variables value by one but returns the original value. We are using it as an expression which will return the original value of X, but it also has a side effect. It 
increases x by 1. Alternatively, we are using it as a statement to increment x with the side effect that it returns a value. Whichever way you look at it, it has a side effect. The pre-increment form is written by adding plus plus before the variable and you can see over here plus plus x that I've highlighted that also increases the value of x by 1 but it returns the new value. In both the cases x end up with the value of 4. In the first case y got the original value of x and ends up as 3. In the second case y got the new value of x 4. Even with those simple expressions, I suggest you don't do it. So I'll rewrite the, those two bits of code. Okay. So what I will do is I'll just comment this here and I'll say let y is equal to x and I'll say x plus plus. All right. So this works the same way as the single statement and over here I'll just comment this out again and I'll press enter and I'll say x plus plus and then y is equal to x. Now I'll save the file and you will notice that even after running the program you will see the output matches the one that we have written here. Okay. So there's no difference in the output. Okay. I'll just add this string over here. This is a little bit incorrect. Yeah. So yeah, it matches the output. Now this is a lot cleaner and it's a lot clear with no doubt about the value that y ends up with. So these two lines over here assign 3 to the y and then increment x to 4 and then these two lines increment x to 4 first and then assign that to the value y. Note that the advice of not to use plus plus and minus minus in an expression doesn't prevent you using them as a statement like these like on line number four and these lines okay that's very common especially in for loops it's such a common thing to do in fact that when a c language was evolved they named it c plus plus after the syntax so the side effect doesn't cause a problem here because we are not using the value Okay, so I'll do the same for the last two expressions as well. So I'll scroll down here. Okay, and I'll rewrite them in a more understandable way. Okay, so what I will do is I'll comment this over here. I'll press enter. And I'll say x plus plus. Let z is equal to x. Y is equal to z minus x and then x plus plus okay and then on this particular line here okay so here also i'll comment this okay and we will say z is equal to x and x plus equal to 2 and y is equal to z minus x. Now if I save this file and the program reloads and the output is the same. Okay, so you can run the program and we get the same results as we had before. If working out what those plus plus expressions were doing has made your head hurt, then I can think of no better reason to avoid them. It's fine to use them as a statement like I have done over here, you can see, and even over here, okay, it's fine to use them as a statement. That's a very common way of doing things in the for loop. 
So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood how this code was working, which we had written in our previous lecture. And we learned how to remove side effects and simplify it to the more understandable form. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we will be discussing more on operators precedence. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity or I should say more clarity on this concept. So let's get started. For this lecture, I will continue using our operators project and I'll start by deleting all the code and we'll add some more examples to it. So I'll just clear this file here. Okay. And let's head over to our browser and we will head over to this table that we were discussing. So referring back to this table, we have looked at primary operators and mentioned the unary operators. Unary operators are operators that have a single operand. For example, minus x produces the negative value of x. You can also use plus x, but that's redundant and it's just the value of x. So why not use x and save typing? Until you get into more advanced code, the unary operators you will generally need are minus to negate a value and exclamation. So we will have exclamation over here. So it's called logical not. So this is the exclamation, which means logical not. And we will be using that in the condition or in the conditions that as it applies to the Boolean values. I'll skip over typecasting for now, but you'll see later that it can be useful. So next we get the arithmetic operators with multiplication over here, having higher precedence than addition, which is listed over here. So this table is in the order of increasing order of the precedence. Okay. So you can see multiplication has a higher precedence than that of addition. If two operators are in the same section, then they have the equal priority. That means you evaluate them from left to right. That is what it means. In some cases involving multiplication and division doesn't really make any difference. So let me give you an example. Okay. So I'll head over to my IDE and I'll start writing a is equal to 12 into three divided by four. Okay. So I'll type in a couple of lines of code. So we have these three statements and now I'll add a console.log. Okay. So I'll say console.log and I'll print the values. So we have these three statements that evaluate to a value and we have, we have a print statement where we are printing these three values. So run the program. So I'll hit save and we will see the output here on the right hand side. And you can see the output says that a, b, c are all nine, regardless of the odd order that the operations are performed. If there is a decimal point, it will give you the fractional part. Okay. But there's no decimal in over here. So now let's evaluate the expressions. Okay. So on this line here, I'll just zoom in a bit. Okay. So this line here, a is evaluated from, from left to right. Okay. Because multiplication and division have the same precedence. So 12 times three 
gives 36 divided by 4 gives you 9. Then B on the line is same as A. The parentheses are redundant over here in this expression, but including them can help to indicate your intent. And you will find many programmers use parentheses even when they are not necessary. The program just ignores them in that case. Okay. Now when evaluating C over here, you can see the parentheses on this line change the order. The parentheses meaning grouping in operator precedence table have the highest priority of all. Now that means three divided by four will be evaluated first. Okay. And that's something to watch out for. Generally always use floating point value when dividing unless you really do want to perform integer division. When performing division, also remember that it isn't cumulative or cumulative. The order that you perform a series of division results or operations will alter the result. So let me show you this. So what I will be doing is I'll just copy this and I'll paste it over here. I'll say D E and F. And then I'll convert all of them to decimals over here. So I'll paste this everywhere. Okay. And I'll add division over here, all the places. Now, if you want three divided by four to be evaluated first, we have to explicitly change the order with the parentheses as I have done to calculate F. And this is over here. Now let us run the program. So I'll hit save. So after running the program, we are seeing the same output. And that's because we are not printing D, E, and F, but we are printing A, B, and C. So I'll just change these. Okay. I'll hit save. And you can see that parentheses have changed the order that expressions are evaluated in. The value of F is now 16. Okay. If you even change this to multiplication, so let me do that. You will see this is nine, but if you change this to divide, it is 16. Okay. You will see no decimal points are being printed because they aren't any. If there are decimal values, the decimal points will be printed. So I'll finish the video with a little bit of addition and subtraction. Okay. So I'll just copy this and I'll paste it over here. Okay. I'll add X, Y and Z. Okay. And I'll even print them over here so that we don't make any mistakes. Okay. Now over here, I'll say 12 plus three. Okay. And minus four. I'll copy this and I'll paste it over here as well as over here. And here I'll try to change the precedence. So I'll change it to this over here. And here also I'll change the precedence. So I'll add this and Okay. So if I save this, you will see that we get 11, which is the same value for all the three expressions. That wouldn't be the case if we multiplied instead of subtracting. Okay. So instead of subtracting, if I change this to multiplication, so I change that and let me hit save. So you can see the values have changed. And that is because multiplication has higher precedence than addition. So three times four is evaluated first this time. And the next time, I mean, when we are evaluating Y it's the parenthesis and that's redundant. Okay. Sorry. So this time there is no parenthesis, but on this line, there is parenthesis and it changes the 
order okay but on this line where we are calculating z the parentheses are redundant okay and it's okay to skip because the results are same and multiplication is anyways evaluated first but here parentheses change the order of evaluation and hence we get a different result like 60 instead of 24. So before we look at relational and conditional operators, we are going to have a look at an interesting use for the third multiplicative operator. Okay, so we have used multiplication and division to multiply and divide. There's a third operator often called as modulus operator. So if you switch over to the table, you can see here it's being referred to as remainder. Okay. So there are multiple, like some people refer it as modulus. Some people refer it as remainder. And this is a symbol. It's the percentage and it returns the remainder after the division. So we'll look at the use for that in the upcoming lecture. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity of operator precedence now. Okay. We have tried out a few examples in this lecture, which gave you a fair clarity as to how operator precedence works. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the remainder operator. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how remainder operator can be useful. How can you use it? And we will also learn this with the help of hands-on examples. So let's get started. So first of all, I'll just add a new JS file over here because we are going to write some code for remainder operator. So I'll just call this file as remainder.js. Fair enough. And I'll just copy the name over here of this file. And I'll go to index.html and I'll link it to this JS file here. I'll hit save. Okay. So we are now referring to this remainder.js in our index.html. Okay. So one use for the remainder or modulus operator is to decide if one number divides exactly into another. We saw that in an earlier video where we were looking at whether one bit of code was better than another. And we saw this in one of our slides. So let me start writing in some code. Okay. I'll start by creating a couple of variables. So first I'll create a variable X initialized to 12. And then I'll create a variable Y and I'll initialize it to three. Now I'll say if X percentage Y is equal to zero. Okay. Then we'll print the message console dot log and we'll say X, sorry, Y divides exactly into X and I'll add a semicolon. Okay. We'll add an else statement here. Okay. And we will say, okay, I'll, I'll just copy this instead of typing that whole line again. So I'll paste this and I'll expand. So I'll say console.log Y does not divide. Okay. So exactly into X. Okay. So far so good. I'll just zoom this out a bit and I'll reduce the size of this. Okay. So, so far so good. I'll hit save. You can see this running onto your browser and you can see three divides exactly into 12 is the output what we have got. All right. 
So you can run the program with different values of X and Y and see how it works. Okay. You can also use this to check if the number is even or an odd. If there's no remainder after dividing by two, then the number is even. Okay. Let's say we want to work out what next month is. Now that seems easy. We just add one to the correct current month, right? So I'll just comment this out. Okay. And I'll say let month is equal to three. And I'll say, I'll just copy this console.lock to save some typing effort over here. And I'll say the next month, the next month after dollar month is month plus one. Easy. Okay. And I'll hit save and we will run and we'll see the output is next month after three is four. Okay. Which is April, which is fine. This works for every month from January until November, but December, however, will cause problems. So if you say 12 and if you hit save, it'll say the next month after 12 is 13. That's not so good. We want one for January, but we got 13. We could start writing an if else to check if month is 12 or not. That would work fine, but this remainder operator or percentage gives an easier way. If it returns the remainder after division, most months will just return themselves when we use the remainder with 12. To see what I mean, I'll put this code into a loop. Okay, so I'll say for and I'll add a for loop here. I'll say let month is equal to, okay, less than equal to 12. Okay, I'll say 12 and I'll remove this and I'll say month plus plus and I'll move this line of code inside here. I'll just delete this. Okay. And I'll just comment this out. Okay. So you can see we have a for loop. Okay. And I have month equal to zero month less than equal to 12. It should be equal to, and I'm, I've just taken console.log inside. Okay. And I'll change this to month percentage or remainder 12 and I'll hit save. Let us check what the output is. So you can see the output over here. Next month after zero is zero after one is one. Okay. Something is wrong. So I have to start from one. Okay. So you can see the output here. So month percentage 12 over here returns the same value as the month except for all months except 12. Okay. The remainder after dividing one by 12 over here, you can see is one. Okay. The same when you divide two by 12 and take the remainder 12 goes into two zero times with a remainder of two, right? That is how this works. When we get to 12 percentage 12, the result is different. 12 goes into 12 once with a remainder of zero. To find out the next month, we can add one to the value we get from the remainder operator. So we can say plus one over here and I can hit save and you can see the output over here. So after running, you can see that we get the correct number for the next month. That's pretty neat. We have got a way to handle a circular sequence of values. The sequence of month number counts up from one to 12, then goes back round to one. That's 
easier than using an if else to decide how you should handle december i'll show you what if else code looks like but we have already got familiar in our rock paper and scissors game okay so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how remainder operator works and how it is useful we saw this with the help of an example so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the remainder in rock, papers and scissors game. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how remainder operator can be implemented in an actual program. So let's get started. So to start with, I will close these files and I'll switch over to rock, paper and scissors game. I'll open main.js. So I'll add some comments here initial in, on the initial lines and you can see the comments here being pasted. So these comments show what beats each one. We know that rock beats scissor. Looking at the comment, scissor has value two. Okay, here you can see scissor has a value of two. If we add one to it to get three, then take the reminder after dividing by three, we get zero. So as you can see over here. Now here next, you can see that rock plus one is so zero plus one, one. So this will evaluate to one. And then one percentage three is one. Okay. Same for this next line, like one plus one is equal to two and two remainder three is again two. Okay. So by applying that calculation to the computer choice, we know that the computer has lost if the player has the same value. We still need to test for draw, of course, but these complicated conditions, like if you scroll down here, you can see the complicated condition over here. This can be replaced. So these condition is what I'm talking about. So what I will be doing is I will just comment this out and I'll say else if else if and and here I'll add a condition I'll say player value is equal to I'll say computer value plus one and I'll say percentage three okay now let us run the program and we will see that this still works. So I'll open this with the live server. Okay. And we'll say rock. Okay. And okay. We need to enable console as well. So I'll just enable that here. So I'll refresh. I'll say rock. Computer choose rock, player choose rock, it's a draw. Yes, I want to play again. Paper. Computer choose scissors, player choose paper and computer wins. So the program still works, okay. You may decide that else if condition was more readable. That's fine when you write your code, write it in the way that makes the most sense to you, okay. We are showing techniques that may be useful or that you may find in the code that you have to work with. So it's important to know the techniques. Okay. But you should write the code in a way that makes more sense to you. So if this makes sense to you, you can keep it this way or else this is just the another way of getting the same output. Now, before I finish the condition that I've highlighted over here, helps to demonstrate why equality operator. So equality operator, it means two equal to sign. 
So this operator has lower precedence than arithmetic operators. And this condition explains why. Everything on the right hand side must be evaluated first in order for the condition to work. If you are still unsure, consider what happens when I use parenthesis to force the evaluation of equal to before percentage. So let me add parenthesis. So I'll add over here and one just before the percentage. I'll hit save. Okay. And I'll hit refresh. I'll say rock paper so you can see it's still working okay but you might end up in error or this is not the right way of doing it because you are forcing the evaluation of this condition before this is being evaluated breaking that expression down into sub expressions so we have computer value plus one first Okay, let's say that's evaluated at two, any value would do for this discussion. So I'll pick two. Next, we have player value is equal to equal to two. So assuming the value two for computer value plus one, okay, that's going to evaluate to either true or false. And whichever it is, we are then going to attempt to perform the remainder operation with this. And this will be Boolean. So true remainder three is obviously nonsense and it's, it's not the right way of doing it, but I'm not getting any error here. Surprisingly, I don't know why. Okay. It is still working, but yeah, but just make sure that uh, you are aware of this. Okay. So I'll undo this change for now. Okay. I'll just remove these parentheses. All right. So that's about the remainder operator in the rock paper and scissor game and how can you modify the code to make it work with the remainder operator so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity on the remainder operator now and i'll see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back in this lecture, we will be continuing our discussion for operators by looking at relational and conditional operators. By the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what relational operators are and how can you use them and conditional operators in your projects. So let's get started. And to start with, I will create one more file here in the operators project. And I'll call this file as relational. So I'll say rel con. I think that will be better. Because we're talking about relational and conditional operator. I'll say rel con. Seems good. I'll just load this in the browser and I'll keep the console open. Okay. So far so good. And I'll close all the other files. Okay. So the relational operators return a Boolean value, which is either true or false. We have looked at them before and used them in our code. They have a lower precedence than the arithmetic operators, which makes sense when you consider an expression like what we are going to write now. So I'll write an expression. I'll say second is equal to 31 and let minute is equal to one. And then I'm going to say if minute is less than 59 and second plus one is greater than 59 then we do minute plus plus relational operators have lower precedence than the arithmetic operator which will make a sense when you look 
at this expression here okay so in this expression you can see here the statement here okay so it wouldn't make sense to attempt to evaluate 59 and second okay so it won't make sense to do this okay and just as little sense to try to add one to the result okay I'll add parenthesis to split up that expression into sub expressions that reflect the precedence of various operators. So I'll add one over here and one here. Highest precedence is plus. So you can see this is what uh, the expression now looks like. Okay. And then I'll add more uh, parentheses so the relational operator less than and greater than have higher precedence than the conditional and operator leading to the next set of parentheses so i'll add one parenthesis over here and then one over here It's now easier to see what's going on, but we haven't changed the meaning of code at all. I've applied parentheses in the same places that the precedent rules cause the sub expressions to be evaluated. Although those parentheses are redundant, you will find programmers will often include them. This expression is about as complex as I would write one without using parentheses. If we had more expressions in there, I would be adding parentheses even though they would be redundant. In fact, I think it looks better with parentheses. So I'm going to leave them. I would suggest you do that. If you are not sure about the precedence rules when writing an expression, okay, it's quicker to type parentheses than it is to refer back to the documentation. So I'll switch back to the link from Mozilla here in the browser. And we have covered the conditional and operators. So you can see uh, where is the conditional and. So you can see these are the and and or operators and have also used them in Boolean expressions. There's one more thing I want to say about them and that will be in the next lecture. We have talked about the conditional operator also sometimes known as the ternary operator. We even had a challenge to use it. So there's nothing more to add here. The other operators that we should discuss are assignment operators. The assignment operators are something that you will see very often and something we have already used. But before that, in the next video, we will discuss what short circuit evaluation is. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity of the conditional operator and the relational operators. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we will learn about short circuit evaluation. And for that, what I'll be doing is I will be creating a new JavaScript file. So I'll close this one and I'll add a new JavaScript file in my operators project and I'll call it short circuit short circuit and I'll press enter and in index.html I'll change this to short circuit dot chase I'll hit save so here in the JavaScript file we will be writing some code okay and what we will be discussing is I will be trying to show you something that doesn't happen. That's quite hard to do unless it's obvious that it hasn't happened. What I will do is I will create a function that's badly coded. 
it's going to divide two numbers, but won't make any check that the divisor isn't zero. Dividing by zero gives infinity as an output. So I'll say function and I'll call this function as divide to numbers. And in parameters, I'll say X comma Y. And here I'll say console. So I'll say console dot log. I'll just print high and I'll say return X by Y. Okay, that's horrible code, but we'll see how to catch things like divide by zero errors later on. I'll test that it works by calling a couple of times. Okay, so what I will do is I'll create a few variables. I'll say A is equal to 12 and let B is equal to six. And I'll say let C is equal to divide to numbers A comma P. Fair enough. And I will say if C is equal to two, then we can write in console dot log and we'll print the message. We have found a two. So far so good. I'll hit save. Okay. And you will see that we get, we have found a two printed out. Now I'll change B to zero and I'll hit save. Okay. Now after saving the output, you will see is just high. You don't get any output. And the reason for this is the output is infinity since we are dividing by zero. Okay. So what I can do is I can say, I can just print the value of C. So I'll just copy this and I'll say print C here and I'll hit save. And you can see the result is infinity. If you add a print statement, you will notice that infinity is being printed. Now here we can check that B isn't zero before calling the method. So I can say if B not equal to zero. And I'll just move this curly brace at the bottom here, like so. And I'll indent this a bit. All right, now this works fine, okay? So we won't get anything printed out because B is zero. Okay, what if we try to simplify that code? Okay, so I'll comment this code here. Okay, I'll just comment this part. And I'll write a simplified version of this code. So I'll say if B not equal to zero and divide by divide two numbers like a comma p is equal to two. Okay. Then we can print in like we can print this statement here. So I'll say console log we have found a two. Now here we test the value of b first. Okay. If you can see all right, so we test the value of B first over here to make sure it's not zero. And this is where short circuit evaluation is important. Without it, JavaScript would test that B isn't zero, then call the method to test that it doesn't return two. So here, if that happened, our code would print high. We know that B is zero and we know that divide to numbers prints high. Short circuit evaluation also called as McCarthy evaluation 
means that the second expression isn't evaluated if the result is clear from the first one. So false and anything is false which means there is no point in JavaScript evaluating the second expression. Whatever it returns, the overall result will be false. If that's the case, the code shouldn't print high and I'll run it. So I'll hit save and you can see like you are not seeing any output over here and make sure that it doesn't print. That proves that the second expression hasn't been evaluated because the code would have printed high if that was evaluated. That's a very useful feature. Okay, false and anything can be evaluated to false without evaluating the anything. When using or, true or anything will return true regardless of what anything is. I'll add that code again using or this time, okay? So what I will do is I will just copy this, comment this out and I'll add this over here and I'll add or over here instead of and. And I'll save the file and you will see hi being printed over here. This is because the first part of the condition is evaluated to false and hence it needs to check for the second part of the condition. What's important is that both and and or will short circuit the second part of the expression when the result is clear from the first part alone. I haven't tested that it works when B isn't zero. Okay, so I'll change B to six and I'll hit save and run the program and you should get the message over here. All right, so that's about this class guys and that's about short circuit evaluation. So in this lecture, we learned what short circuit evaluation is and how it works. All right, I hope you guys have a fair clarity of this concept now. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the assignment operators. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what they are. So we have already used them, but you will have some more information with assignment operators. So to begin with, what I will do is I will close the short circuit.js and I will create a new file here in my operators project and I'll call this as assignment.js. And here I will point this file to the newly created JS file. So this HTML now points to assignment.js. So far so good. So assignment operators are the last set of operators I want to have a look at. They basically combine one of the arithmetic operators with assignment. You can also use them with shift and logical operators, but we are not covering those in this course. There's not a lot to say about them really. You can check what they do by creating some examples and printing out results. So let's do that for a couple of them, all right? So what I will be doing is I will say, I'll say let x is equal to 12 and I'll say x plus is equal to 34. And then I'll say console.log x, okay? And so this is a code that we will go through and this code adds 34 to the current value of x. The result when we run the program, so if I save this file and if I see the output is 46. Now we could subtract 34 instead by changing this to minus. 
and hitting save but this time the output will be 22. Okay, so I'll just do some realignment so that we have a better view. So we can even add multiplication over here. So I can just switch this to multiplication. Okay, and I can hit save and you can see a different output over here. Okay, now that's the same code as using minus Y instead of X. Okay. What I can do is I can just copy it and I can paste it over here. Instead of X, I'll have Y, Y and Y. And here also I'll say Y is equal to Y into 34. And if I save, you will see the same output here as well. And this is the same code using Y instead of X because X has already been changed. Okay, they both produce the same result 408. Now you can think of this line over here as the shorthand way of writing this long form. But I advise against taking the advantage of the difference. These assignment operators also have a side effect. And the argument against it is the same as the argument against using plus plus as an expression. Side effects make your code hard to understand and difficult to maintain as a result. So I'll add some more code over here. Okay, so, so I'll say let z is equal to y is equal to 8. And I can say console dot log backticks y is let's print out the value for y and i'll add a comma i'll say z is dollar set okay and if you hit save okay you will see the output but let us understand this a bit i made a mistake over here so this is not y equal to equal to 8, but this is y minus equal to 8. Okay. So if I hit save, okay. So this particular thing subtracts 8 from the current value of y and assigns the result back to y. All right. It also returns the result and that returned result is assigned to Z later on. Now, when I run the program, both Y and Z have the value of 400. So don't do that. Use these operators as assignment statements like I have done here at the top. That's fine. Using them in an expression like over here results in the code that's hard to maintain. Okay, so that's the operators that we'll be using in this course. Many of them we have already used, but you may not have been aware of how useful remainder operator can be, for example. So that's about this class, guys. In this lecture, we took a look at the do's and don'ts of the assignment operator. And we covered this with the help of an example. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section summary for operators. So who would have thought that there was so much to know about operators? In this section, we have looked at operators that you are most likely to need in your programs. You already have been familiar with many of them, but you may not have realized how useful the remainder or modulus operator can be. It's great when dealing with a set of values that cycle back around. Other examples of that are things like seconds in a minute and minutes in an hour. When you get to 59 minutes, the next value is zero. 
and not 60. We have looked at operators precedence to understand the order that operators bind to their operands. Expressions can give different results depending on the order that you evaluate the sub expressions and operator precedence ensures that expressions are evaluated consistently. If you are ever unsure about the order, you can use parenthesis to force evaluation in the order that you want. Experienced programmers use parenthesis even when they are redundant. They are a good way to document your code because they make your intention clear. Anyone reading the code doesn't have to pause to think about the precedence rules. Short circuit evaluation is important and helps us write code that doesn't crash. We have used the example of dividing by zero, but you can also test that an index value is in the range before attempting to use it to access items in a string or an array. In the earlier section, we looked at methods with side effects. There are a few operators that also have side effects, such as the pre and post increment and decrement operators. That's like X plus plus. We saw that using these operators on the right hand side of an expression can result into code that's very hard to understand. Our suggestion is not to do it because code that's hard to understand is even harder to maintain. Assignment operators are used a lot. That's things like plus equals and minus equals. They can take a little while to get used to, but once you are comfortable with them, they can make code quicker to read. The assignment operators also have side effects. And once again, we suggest you don't use them on the right hand side of an expression. If there's anything that you are not sure about, then watch the videos again before moving on. You will get plenty of practice using operators in the remainder of the course, and it will all become second nature before long. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys had fun learning about operators and that's the end of the section as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed this section and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section introduction and we will be covering what we are going to learn in this section. In this section, we will look at working with strings in JavaScript. Although this is a section about strings, we are also going to introduce some other concepts that apply to more than strings. After we have covered indexing, you will understand a lot more of the code in the ELIZA project. I've mentioned that strings are immutable, which means a string can't be changed once you have created one. In this section, we will discuss a bit more on that concept of immutability and understand how strings work. We will be discussing different methods that are available to work with strings. So there's a lot to cover and let's get started. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss what is a string. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to this concept of strings and how do strings in JavaScript work. So let's get started. We have used strings 
a lot in our code so far, but we haven't really defined what they are. In JavaScript, a string is a sequence of zero or more Unicode characters. If you are not familiar with Unicode, let me switch over to my browser. So Unicode is a way to represent the thousands of different characters that are used when writing in various languages. So you can see this Wikipedia article over here. And this is a good introduction to what Unicode is. Strings are immutable, which means that a string can't be changed after it's created. I mentioned that back in section four, when we looked at types. In this section, we will see why that's important and how strings appear to be changed when we do things with them. In this video, we are going to go back to the basics and have a look at how to create strings. Don't worry, I'm going to keep it short because you already know most of what I'm going to cover. So to begin with, I will switch over to my IDE here and I will create a new pro project over here. So a project means a new folder here and I'll call this folder as string examples. All right. Now I'll just copy these two files, index.html and main.js. If you want, you can create it from scratch, but I'll rather copy this one because it, that's easy. And I'll delete this code here. I'll also launch this with the help of live server here. Okay, it's open. And what I will do is I'll close all and I'll open only main.js. All right, so far so good. So we have this file created and I'm going to start writing some code over here. So I'm going to say let course name is equal to learn JavaScript for beginners crash course. All right, I'll just expand this a bit so that it has a better visibility and I'll create one more variable. I'll say message is equal to welcome to with the space. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to concatenate course name and message to create a new string. All right. And I'm going to say let full message is equal to message plus course name. And I'm going to print console dot log and I'll say full message here. I'll end this with a semicolon. All right. Now what I will be doing is I will open up this console here and I'll save this file and you can see the message being printed. Welcome to learn JavaScript for beginners crash course. All right. So what I want to say is we can concatenate strings to create a new string like I've done over here on this particular line here. Okay. We can use string interpolation as well. So let me show that to you as well. So I can say let full message to is equal to, I'll say dollar message and I'll say dollar course name. I'll just copy this and I'll say full message to here. All right. Now, when I run this program, you will see the same message is being printed twice, as you can see over here on the right hand side in the output. So this is about concatenation and creating new strings from the already existing strings. I mentioned that string is a sequence of characters. 
All right, so if string is a sequence of character, we should be able to get at each individual character. We can using something called as indexing. So let me just zoom this in, okay, and expand. I'll say four and I'll just get the syntax for this printed. And here I'll say course name dot length index plus plus, okay. And here I'm saying let character, okay. This is let character course name index and I'll say console dot lock, okay. And I'll print out the character, okay. So if you're curious how I got this entire syntax automatically printed, so you can also in Visual Studio Code. So if you say for, you will see this for keyword here or this option with a square over here, like you can see. So if you select this one, it will print out the entire syntax for the same, all right? So let's go through what we have written. So we can use a normal for loop to access each and every character in the course name string one by one, all right? So here, this is a for loop defined. You can see index starts from zero. Index goes up till course name dot length and we are getting every character and we are printing it onto the console. I'll just hit save and you can see over here on the output, it says learn JavaScript for beginners, crash course as well. All right. So after you run the program, you will see that each individual character is printed out on a new line on the console. And I'll have to scroll the console window up to see them all. But the point I'm trying to make over here is every character has been printed out. Now you can notice one thing that every space has been counted as a character just like any other. Now indexing into a string is extremely useful when using various methods of strings. It's those methods that are the main focus of this section. And I'll talk a bit more about indexing before we look at them. All right, so that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood what is a string. We learned how to create new type of string from already existing strings. And we used indexing basically, and we got every character in a string and printed it onto our console. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about indexing and we'll learn how indexing works with strings. So let's get started. Indexing objects in JavaScript isn't just used for strings. We also need to understand indexing for arrays and lists. The basic principle is the same regardless of the object that is being indexed. Because it's so important, I'll spend a bit of time explaining more about it in this lecture. So I'll continue with the same project, the string examples project. And what I will be doing is I will be commenting all these lines over here. All right. I'll just take this to the side here. All right. All right. So indexing positions start at zero in most programming languages and JavaScript is no exception. Computers start counting from zero. We humans do the same thing when numbering the floors in the buildings. The first floor in many parts of the world is up one flight of stairs. The floor at ground level is called the ground floor 
and has the number zero in the elevator. In America, Canada and parts of Asia, the first floor you get to is the one you enter at. You will be numbered one in the elevator. There are exceptions, of course. Sweden uses American system and starts numbering at one. Hawaii used to use European system but has switched to the American system unless you speak the Hawaiian language because the floors labeled in Hawaiian use the European system, which is fascinating, I'm sure. But why am I going on about it? I'm going on about it because I'm hoping to annoy you. I want you to be shouting angrily at the screen. Come on, Faisal, get on with it. If you are not annoyed yet, I've got a whole load of useless facts about floor numbering systems around the world. I haven't mentioned Japan yet, nor the half floor systems in Spain and Italy. In UK, floors in the Norfolk and Norwich University hospitals have different numbers depending on which side you enter the building because it's built on two levels. Okay, hopefully you are annoyed enough now so that you remember this video as the annoying one. Every time you have to index a string or any other object, you will remember being annoyed and that will remind you that indexes start at zero. Indexing itself is a straightforward concept. You just use square brackets and the job is done. Very few students have a problem with that. When we get questions about indexes not behaving as expected, it's usually because the student has forgotten that the index starts at zero. What number do indexes start at? Indexes start at zero. All right, I think I've made the point. Now let's finish with some examples. But if we get any questions that looks like you have forgotten that indexes start counting at zero, I'll add one more fact about floor numbering to this lecture for each question. All right. So what I will do is I will paste something over here at the top. So I'll scroll up here and I'll paste over here. Yeah. So you can see that I've pasted in a comment to show the position of each character in the course name string. You can see over here. All right. That's easier and less error prone than counting the characters every time you want to refer to them. I'll print out to practice accessing individual characters by their index. Okay. So I'll just remove this code because we don't need it anymore. And I'll say console dot log and I'll say course name. I'll say zero. I'll hit a semicolon. Okay, you can see L being printed on the right hand side. Okay, and that's because L resides at the zeroth index over here. All right, I'll copy this. Okay, and I'll say seven over here. I'll hit save. You will see A being printed. All right. Now what I will do is I will run a for loop. All right. Let us see a for loop. I'll say instead of index, I'll say I, I is equal to, I'll say 13. Let me say 13. Okay. It's editing everything. I'll press escape. I'll say 13 uh, is less than. So I'll just remove this. I'll say I is less than 21. I plus plus and I'll just copy this console.log so that it's easier console.log and I'll say course name I. 
All right, so far so good. Now, so this particular thing should be easy to understand and even this one, okay? So just to reiterate, here we are getting the index, we are using the index of zero and we are getting the first character in the string, all right? Because indexes start at zero, all right, remember. Next, we are going to print the character at index seven that you can see over here and you saw A being printed, okay? And this particular loop then starts printing all the character at position 13 to the position 20, okay? Because this is less than and not less than equal to. So this will print up to position 20, which is up to the, this space here, all right? So let us save and see the output and you can see the output over here. All right, so it says IPT. So this is where the loop starts printing in. All right, and you can see we get what we expect, okay? So we get L on the first line, A followed by the next, so far so good. And then it prints out the eight characters starting at position 13 up to the position 20. Experiment printing out different characters and in the next video, we'll take a look at some of the more concepts or we'll discuss strings a little bit more in detail. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity about indexing and how can you get to every character in a string using their indexes. So that's about this class. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about string length and how can you figure out the string length when working with strings in JavaScript. Let's get started. When indexing a string, you need to be very careful not to access positions that aren't in the string. The start of the string is very easy to find. It's position zero. I don't need to say any more about that. But what about the end of the string? If a string contains 10 characters, we and we try to access the 11th, we will get an error. Strings have a length property that gives the number of characters in the string. That's handy. We can make use of it and make sure that we don't try to index beyond the end of the string. Let's see that in our for loop, okay? So here we have this for loop and I'll change it to print out all the characters from position 13 to the end of the string. So right now it's printing characters up till 20th index, okay? Which is less than 21, all right? So what I will do is I'll say over here, course name dot, and once you put in dot, you will see a lot of string methods, okay? So you can see char at is a method, char code at is a method. If you scroll down to length, you can see it's a property. All right, and if you click on this arrow, you can see returns the length of the string object. Makes sense. I'll press enter over here. So we'll use this property, all right? And I'll hit save. You can see the entire string being printed now. Fair enough. I'll also print one more thing additionally. So I'll say console dot log instead of assert I'll say sorry I'll say log and here I'll say course name dot length and I'll hit save you can see the length of the string is 43 all right and here like at the top IPT okay it says later on a beginner's crash course. Okay, fair enough. So below this, the program prints out the value of course name dot length. 
which is 43 and which means that there are 43 characters in this string and they are indexed from 0 to 42. All right. The comment over here at the top makes it easy to check the position of individual characters. All right. We can find out how long the string is, which makes it easy to make sure that our code doesn't run off the end. You'll still do it at some point. So let's see what the error looks like when you do so. So I'll change the for loop over here. And instead of less than course name dot length, I'll print out. So I'll say equal to course name dot length and I'll hit save and just see what happens when the program is run. You see undefined being printed at the end. So that's what happens when you try to access a character outside the string. And I'll undo that change here. All right. And I'll hit save and the error, or I should say the undefined that was being printed goes away. Now I mentioned in an earlier video that it's not just the string that we can index and anything that we can index will have an equivalent length property. Now I don't want you to worry too much about this in the next bit of code. Okay. Because we haven't covered lists yet, but I think it will be useful to quickly demonstrate indexing a list to show that indexing can apply to other things as well. So just for a while, what I will do is I will switch over to list search here and I'll open main.js. All right. Now this project or this file was created to get a more realistic example of why break can be useful, but it's also a good example of retrieving items from a list using their index positions. All right. So if you scroll down here, you can see this line over here. Here we are using a for loop. So you can see this is a for loop and this is very similar to the one that we have seen. So let me expand this code a bit. And this is very similar to the one that we have already just seen. Okay. You can see the length property in action that we are using. All right and matches is not a, so it is a list. As you can see, it's a list. All right. Now the code itself is from Eliza project. And each time you go round the loop, we get the next item in the matches list using the concept of indexing. And this is the same code we used to get the next character in our string a moment ago. So there's some good news. Everything we have learned about indexing strings also applies to indexing other things like lists. And that brings us to the end of this lecture guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class in this lecture. We learned a bit more about how can we get the length of the string so that we don't run over our string. Because if we run over our string, we are going to see undefined being printed because we have exceeded the string size. All right. So we learned about the length property, which is a very useful property to help us keep us within the limits of the string. That's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about index of and substrings. So by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a clarity of this concept and we will be taking a look at list search project that we have created previously. So open the list search project if you haven't already and just open this main.js file. Now, if you see over here, like this line, which I have selected over here, we have got a call to the index of method that string provide. 
Now that we understand indexing, it's a lot easier to understand what that line does. Now, what we have done, one more thing over here is we have done something called as method chaining. So we have chained method calls together one after the other. All right, it's quite common, but can be a bit confusing when you are just starting out. So to simplify this, I will be breaking these method calls into individual statements. What I will do is I'll just cut this and I'll add a new variable over here. I'll introduce let lower case is equal to, okay, lower case user input. So I'll say input. Loser, lower case input is equal to input dot user input dot lower case and I'll then use the lower case input dot index of. So this line does the same thing, okay? And this code converts the user input into lower case and then we are using that same thing over here. So instead of chaining methods, we have just broken it down into couple of statements so that it's easier for you to understand. All right. So on this particular line over here that I have selected, the index of method checks to see if one string appears in another. And then on this particular line over here in the if statement, we are checking to see if the match has appeared in the lowercase input. All right. So what I will do is I will just minimize this. I'll hit save and I'll launch this project with the live server. Okay. I'll go to inspect and let me go to sources. So I will be setting a few breakpoints and let's examine our code. So I've set a breakpoint now on line 34 where we are checking if the position is greater than minus one. All right. And the for loop over here at the top is going through the each of the items in the matches. Okay. So let me run this code and you can see we are at the first iteration of the for loop. All right. I'll just zoom out a bit. Okay. Yeah, this is better. Now here you can see the index is zero in the debug pane. All right. Which means that we get the first item from the matches. So this is the first item. This is where we are getting the first item from the matches and we are assigning it to the match. All right. And you can see the value of match, which is initialized to life. And that's the value of match has in the debug pane. Now indexing a list works the same as indexing a string. Only instead of getting a character in the string, we get each item in the list. So in strings, we get every character one by one. But in case of list, we get a one one item. Okay. Now if you scroll up, here, this is the first item that we have got life. Okay. We will remember the second item, which is I need. All right. So if you take a look over here, like the position is also minus one because the match has not been found yet. Okay. And if you look over here, minus one is being returned by the index of a method because life does not appear in the user input string. So user input string is, I think I need to learn C sharp. All right. So that is why it's minus one and minus one isn't a valid index. So the code tests for that over here on the if condition. Okay. We know that the block won't execute because position is minus one. So I'll resume again and you can see over here. Now the match is updated to the second item in the list, which is I need. 
This is something that we just saw in the list over here. I need, all right. Now, looking at this pane at the bottom, you will also see that I need starts at position eight. And the index of has returned the position as eight. We'll often want to manipulate strings when we have found something and having the position where the string was found makes that easy. Okay. So the condition over here, so this condition, which we have set is now set to true. Okay. So if I step over, okay. If I say step over, I'll go inside the if block. Okay. And then I'll go to the break statement. All right. You can see that this particular line 37, which I have highlighted has been executed and we have used the index to get each item that we want to match. Okay. And this code has another list. If you see the list is called responses. This is the list here. Okay. And this list is organized so that the position of responses in this list corresponds to the position of the strings we search for. So the string I need was at position one. Okay. In the matches list and the matching response is at position one in the responses list over here. Okay. And in the output pane or the debug pane, you will see the response over here. Okay. You will see the output over here. I'm sorry. So this is the output. You'll see this particular output on the index one is now a part of the output variable, which is why do you need percentage one? So we have found a match and got the response. The code is now going to break out of the loop from here because we have found what we were looking for. It then prints what we have found and terminates. All right. There's nothing else particularly exciting left to do. So I'll just resume and stop this lecture over here. All right. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we learned how index of works and how we traverse through the string and also through the list as well. And we worked with strings to understand how to figure out if a string exists in another string using index of. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about string comparison. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity about this concept with strings. So in this lecture, I will be working with our string examples project. So I have that open over here and we will look at a few more things we can do when finding the index of one string inside another. So I have string examples project open. If you don't, you should open this project in your IDE and I'll delete most of the old code over here. Okay. So I will just delete this entire piece of code that we have already written. I'll just clear this out. So we just need this string declaration that we have for us to work with. Okay. So JavaScript provides a number of different ways to compare strings because it's not easy as it sounds. We have already seen one problem when comparing strings, we have to allow for upper and lower case. We'll have a quick look at the string comparison values that are available. So let's have another look at index of. So I'll start with a simple example. We want to find the position of space J in this particular text. Okay. So what I will be doing is I will say 
let position i won't assign it anything i'll say position is equal to course name dot index of you can see this suggestion and here i'll pass in space j i'll end this with a semicolon and i'll say console dot log position we know that it's not going to work but let's run just to check it so i'll just reduce the size of this and i'll hit save and i'll just close this and i have this project running over here okay so you see we get minus one being printed here okay here so when we compare strings in javascript the comparison is case sensitive now one solution is to convert to lowercase before comparison okay so what i can do is i can say course name dot lowercase which is two lowercase and it's a method so i'll add two parentheses and i'll hit save now the moment i hit save you see this browser refresh and you see five being printed out we have managed to find space j in the string and we don't have to worry about it appearing in a different case that's good but we have only found the first occurrences how do we check if there are more okay so there is definitely to do that but i'll pause this video for now over here okay so in this lecture we covered how you can search for a string within another string all right and we learned how you can and we did this with the help of index of wherein we are comparing two strings so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss about last index of and finding repeated matches so let's get started so we will be discussing how you can find all the occurrences of a string rather than just the first before we do i will quickly show you the last index of method it works the same way as index of with the same number of arguments but returns the position of the last match rather than the first so what i will be doing is i will be modifying this code that we already have in our project a bit so i'll just duplicate this line okay and or rather than duplicating i'll just edit this one and i'll say last index of so this is the a uh, method that i'll use and i'll hit save so you will see the output as 5 itself it won't change because the string has only one j what i will do instead is i'll add c okay and i'll hit save okay you will see 36 being printed okay but in case of index of let me show that to you as well you will see 30 being printed and that is over here this is a part that is being printed but if you say last index of it prints 36 which is this part over here now there is nothing surprising when i run this okay we get the value 36 sometimes you may need to find the last occurrence rather than the first one and now you know how so what i will do is i'll now change this to index of over here okay and then we'll see how to find all occurrences so calling index of in the same way isn't going to work that will just keep finding the first match what we can do though is provide an extra argument okay so let's see it's working so i'll just copy this and i'll paste it here and i'll 
say over here i'll pass one more argument i'll say position plus one over here okay and i'll hit save so you can see we have 30 and 36 being printed okay so on this particular line okay that you are seeing over here okay we see we have passed one more argument okay and we have told index of method to start after the last matching position so what we have done is we have passed position plus one so it starts matching after position plus one all right rather than from the start of the string that works but copying those two lines again and again isn't really a good way to do it so we would have to know how many matches are there instead we can use a do while loop so what I will do is I will just delete this. Okay. And I'll just modify our code slightly. So I'll say position is equal to minus one. Okay. I'll just initialize this to minus one and I'll say do. And this goes until here and I'll say while position is not equal to minus one all right and i'll end this with a semicolon so far so good so we have initialized the position to minus one because we start from position plus one so that is the reason for initializing it to minus one so it, it's it will start from zero okay in the first round and next time in the next round, we will start searching for the character after the previous match because we'll have position over here. All right. Now, if I save this here, you can see we have got 30, 36 and minus one being printed. So when processing this value, you would want to test that position isn't minus one, of course, because we are getting because we are seeing that being printed, of course. All right. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how you can figure out the repeated matches in a given string. And we also took a look at last index of method in this lecture. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss how can we process matches and replace. So in, by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity of this concept and how can you make this happen with strings in your project. So let's get started. So I'll give you an example of processing the matches we have found in the course name. All right, so we have found all the places where C appears in our string. Now let's see how we can replace them with JavaScript. This will let me introduce you to new method replace. The built-in replace method does more like a replace all. So what I will be doing is I will delete this code for a bit and I'll say course name is equal to course name dot replace. This is the replace method that I'm talking about. And I'll say, so we'll replace Java with JavaScript. Okay, so I'll say JavaScript. All right, so far so good. And I'll say console.log, okay, course name here. All right. Now I'll hit save and let us see the output in the console. Okay. So you can see learn JavaScript script for beginners crash course. Okay. So all the instances of Java has been replaced with JavaScript, as you can see over here. 
the matching and replacing of the string is case sensitive. If you specify Java with a lowercase j, it won't work as expected. So if I say a lowercase j and let's hit save, you will see it's not working as expected. So that's about the replace method. Okay. That is how you can find the matches of a string and replace them. All right. So in this lecture, we learned about the replace method, which string provides us. It's an inbuilt method. And if you hover on this method, you will see this pop-up, which talks about the function or which talks about not function, but the method in a bit more detail. All right. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to talk about JavaScript string methods. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what are the different methods that JavaScript has to offer us to work with strings and what are the functionalities they provide. Also, they make our life a lot more easier. You will see that in this lecture. So let's get started. So the JavaScript string comes with many useful methods, but you don't have to memorize them all. You will naturally remember the ones that you use a lot, but there are online documentations that are available for the ones you don't remember. So I'll start with this page here that I have loaded in my browser in the JavaScript programming guide. Okay. And this is a page from developer.mozilla.org. This talks in general terms about the string. And when we want more specific information, we want to know what method it's provide so we can get from here. Okay. So on the left hand side, you can see all the methods that exist in string. So this is the property that exists with JavaScript string. And you can see all the methods here. All right. So we have already used the length property to get the length of the string. And if this is collapsed for some reason, you have to just make sure it's expanded and you will see different methods. So you can see the care at method over here. Okay. You can see care at returns a new string consisting of so basically you can read more about this over here. So if you want a particular character at any given index, you can use that. And you also have an editor here to run and see the output right in the browser. Okay. So you have syntax, the parameters definition and what this method returns. If you scroll down, you have a brief description about this method and also some of the examples that are using this particular method. All right. You can just take a scroll. You can see concat. So concat is another method that exists using which you can concatenate two strings. So you can see str1 dot concat space and str2. So it will return hello world. So space is not the part of the string, but it's concatenated over here and you can see world hello. So here we have added comma. So that is how it works. You can have multiple number of parameters. As you can see, there are different versions of this method. Okay. And you can read more and see various examples. Okay. You can see ends with. So end with ends with is another method which tells you if this particular string ends with that particular string or not. So string one ends with best. So you get a Boolean output True. It ends with best and 17 is nothing but the end position as you can see over here in the syntax. So that is also true and ends with question that is false. 
because you have missed a question mark over here. So you can even edit it over here and add a question mark and run this, you can see it's true. So you can just go through this link, you can see index off over here that we just used some time back, okay? You can see last index off, all right? And there are plenty of methods. So you can see replace, replace all, search, and so on. So you can just go through all the methods. You can see two lowercase. This is something we have seen very frequently. Two uppercase, very frequent. You have trim, value of, and so on. So just go through this link. This link is very helpful and it can help you learn more about the capabilities of string in JavaScript. All right, so that's about this class guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the immutable behavior of strings. By the end of this lecture, you will have a understanding as to how strings are immutable. So let's get started. So strings are immutable. This is something that I have mentioned a couple of times in our past lectures. Well, what does that mean? This simply means that strings once created cannot be altered or changed. However, we can assign a new string object to a string reference. So for demonstration purpose, I will go ahead and I'll add a new file over here. I'll call this strings immutable dot js. Okay. And in our index.html, I'll just link it to string immutable dot js instead of main.js. All right. So this file is empty as of now and we'll start writing some code. Okay. So I'll say let S1 is equal to hello JavaScript. So I'll say hello JavaScript. Okay. Now I will be saying S1 dot to uppercase. Now, with this code, what we are doing is we are modifying the value of S1 string and we are converting it to uppercase. But this code won't alter the value of S1. If you print the value of S1, it will still be same. So if I say console.log here, and if I just print S1, and if I hit save, you will see hello JavaScript being printed. Okay, which is the same value that we have, which we initialized. Okay, so this is a clear indication that S1 is not being modified. In order to get the modified value, you will have to assign the value after the case conversion to same or another variable. So I'll be using another variable and what I will do is I, I'll copy this paste this here and I'll say S2 over here and I'll hit save. You can see hello JavaScript over here. All right. And what we are doing over here is we are modifying the value of S1 and we are assigning it to a new variable or a new object over here. And we are printing that. And you can see over here that S1 is not at all modified. Okay, you can even modify the reference to S1. Okay, so you can say, I'll comment this. I will copy this and I will paste here. This will be S1 and I'll say save. Okay, I'll have to comment this as well. And I'll hit save. So you can see now S1 is updated. Okay, so the object reference for S1 is being updated because we are updating and reassigning S1 to a newer value. So that's the immutable behavior of strings, wherein the actual string 
is not modified, although it may appear that it's being modified, but actually it's not. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to talk about concatenating strings and method chaining. By the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what are the different ways of concatenating strings and method chaining. So let's get started. So to begin with, I will create a new file over here. I'll call this as concat and chaining.js. And I'll link this file to our index.html here. So I'll say concat and chaining.js. All right, I'll close everything else. So this file is empty and I'll start creating a couple of strings here with which we will be working in fact in this lecture. So I'll say S1 and I'll copy this and I'll say S2 and this will be JavaScript. Okay. So there are multiple ways in which you can concatenate any given string, okay, to another one. And the first one, so I'll say first way. So the first way is I'll create S3 and I'll say S1 plus space. So it is by using the plus operator, as you can see over here, all right. And I'll say console.log and S3, yeah. So this is the first way in which you can concatenate two strings. As you can see, we are using a plus operator over here. So what we are doing is we are concatenating S1 to space and then we are concatenating S2 and we are assigning the results of this operation to S3 and we are getting S3 printed over here. Now, once you save, you will see the output here saying Java, hello JavaScript. All right. So this is the first way. I'll copy this and paste it here. Let's take a look at the second way. Okay. So here we will remove this let keyword. Okay. And instead of addition, I'll use a method. I'll say dot concat. So you can see this method here, concat. And you can click on this arrow here. And you can see returns a string that contains the concatenation of two or more strings. All right, so you can say concat. And here it will add s2. Okay. Now if I hit save, you will see the same output over here. Okay, concat but without a space. So there is no space that we have given or we have added. Okay. And this brings us to the third way, which is another variant of concat itself. So I'll just copy paste this. And here you can add one more parameter called space. Okay. So I'll just add space. So you can add two parameters in this method. And if you save, you will see the third version here, hello space JavaScript. And the space has appeared because we have added space over here. And this is definitely the third way of doing it. Okay. So these are three ways in which you can concatenate a string. All right. I also wanted to touch upon the topic of method chaining over here. So I'll just duplicate this code here and I'll say chaining. Okay. So here we have one method call to concat. Let's say if I want to do concatenation multiple times, I can add one more concat and I can say any string over here done, for example. Okay. And let's say if I want to convert this to uppercase, I can say full stop to uppercase. like so. And I'll print the value of S3. 
okay like so and if i hit save you can see hello javascript done okay so what we are doing is we are taking the output of this operation we are concatenating it with this and we are passing the output to to upper case and then we are assigning the output or the result to s3 all right so this concept of calling multiple methods okay like you can see over here three times so two times we have called concat and one time uppercase so that's three method calls and this concept is known as method chaining okay another way to do same thing is to like write this on one line assign it to a variable then do the single operation on the next line assign it to a variable and then do this operation on the third line and assign it to a variable and finally print that final variable but this is a lot more concise it reduces the number of lines of code that you have and when you're programming in a real world scenario you will see method chaining being used across multiple times it's quite common to chain methods all right so that's about method chaining and the concatenation of strings so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i'll see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to summarize this entire section this section focused on javascript strings and you learned that they are a sequence of zero or more unicode characters because a string is a sequence of characters we can access individual characters by indexing into the string indexing doesn't just apply to strings and now that you understand it you will be able to work with things like arrays and lists as well do i have to remind you that indexes start at zero please don't make me add more trivial facts about the numbering of floors in a building around the world we have seen how the length property is useful to find out how many characters are there in a string we use that to make sure we didn't try to access characters beyond the end of the string which would lead to undesirable results we have seen most of the string methods including concat last index of index of and replace we demonstrated that strings are immutable and showed you what happens when you try to change them a new string is created so that's about this class and this section guys i hope you guys had fun learning from this section and i'll see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to be discussing about object oriented programming and classes so by the end of this lecture you are going to have a fair clarity as to what are the different principles of object oriented programming and we will also be introduced to classes so we'll discuss each one of them individually let's get started so what is a class classes are used to define a blueprint to create objects python allows you to have methods outside the class and they are known as functions you can even have variables outside the class this is different from programming language like java where you are not allowed to have them outside the class what is a class Documentation describes a class as a data structure that encapsulates a set of data and behaviors that belong together as a logical unit which is a great phrase to trot out in an interview perhaps 
but it doesn't tell us much without more analysis. The keyword in that definition is encapsulates. Encapsulation is one of the basic principles of object oriented programming, which is OOP. We encapsulate data and behaviors by putting them into a class. There's a bit more to it than that, of course. We also have to decide what access to provide to data and how to provide it. And it's a class that encapsulates the data and behavior. For our discussion of classes, I'm going to model an airport. Airports are fairly complex places. They have at least one runway and at least one terminal that serves the runway. Or maybe the runway serves the terminal. If that sounds a bit vague, it's deliberate. We can often model things in many different ways. The more complex something is, the more ways there are generally to model it. The way you choose to model it will depend on what you are trying to do. As we go through these examples, keep an open mind and consider if there might be different ways to think of things. I'll point out possible alternatives from time to time to make the point that there's no single correct way of doing things. Airports can also have shops and restaurants. In fact, if we would already modeled a shopping mall, we could think of airport as a shopping mall with runways. Our airport could inherit a lot of its functionality from a shopping mall model. That's another important principle of OOP or object oriented programming called inheritance. Using inheritance, we can extend or modify the behavior of one class to produce a specialized version of it. In this example, the airport inherits all the attributes of a shopping mall. It will have shops and all the other things that we included in our shopping mall class. It extends the mall model by adding terminals. Often there may be shops and restaurants in each terminal. An alternative way to model the airport might be to treat the terminals as shopping malls with runways. An airport has terminals and the terminals inherit the members of a shopping mall. Terminals extend the shopping mall model by including runways. Design. Designing the most appropriate model for your particular application is the hardest part of object oriented programming. This design may be fine for some applications, but consider what happens when you add a new terminal to the airport. How easy would it be to place shops in the terminal? The shops would belong to the airport because it inherited things like that from the shopping mall class. That's fine. The shop class probably has a location field and we can use that to specify which terminal it's in. With this design, the shop instances would automatically belong to a terminal. That's because here it's the terminal class that inherits the shopping mall class. This would work if we had decided that a terminal serves a runway. We still have other questions to consider though. Can terminals serve more than one runway? Can a runway serve more than one terminal? Or maybe both cases could be true. A runway could provide passengers to more than one terminal and a terminal could receive passengers from more than one runway. Getting your design right is very important. Unfortunately, it's not easy to know what right is, especially as 
there are often more than one design that will work. We will be applying the principles of object oriented programming design in our examples. Designing your classes to work well together comes with experience. Be prepared to make a lot of mistakes and start again. The good news is that it soon becomes obvious when a design isn't going to work. Polymorphism is another principle of object oriented programming. Polymorphism means many shapes and lets us use one object in place of another one. If a method wanted a square, we gave it a circle instead, it may not be too happy. If a method wanted a square and we gave it a circle instead, it may not be too happy. JavaScript is not a strictly typed language. As you can see here, we have not specified the type of the argument that we will be receiving in some method function. You can pass square or a circle as expected. But what if it only wanted to calculate the area? In that case, all it really cares about is that it gets a shape. If our square and circle both behave like shapes, then there shouldn't be a problem using either of them. That's polymorphism in a nutshell. There's more to it than that. And there are different ways to implement it. But that's a high level description of polymorphism. You may be able to spot a problem with what I've just described. What if the method only knew how to calculate the area by multiplying the length of two adjacent sides? That would allow it to work with rectangles as well as squares. But it's not going to handle a circle too well. Calculating the area of a circle is very different to the area of a square. And what if we gave it a triangle? It would be able to find two adjacent sides of a triangle, but multiplying them to find the area wouldn't work. Abstraction. The answer to that problem is solved by the fourth principle of object oriented programming, something called abstraction. Basically abstraction means that our function has no business trying to calculate the area of our shapes. That's something shapes should know how to do. They will encapsulate the method to do that and keep the details of how they do it to themselves. Abstraction sort of follows from encapsulation. Once you have encapsulated data, you don't expose it to the outside world. Our shapes will have some way of providing the area to any program that asks, but the program doesn't need to know how they do it. We may decide to change the way that the area of a circle is calculated. Okay, it's unlikely that we would come up with anything better than pi r squared, but you never know. And yes, this analogy is falling down a bit now. But if we did come up with another way to calculate the area of circle, abstraction means that we can change our area method without affecting anything else that uses it. The calling code will still request the area and will get a value back. It can be helpful to think of encapsulation as applying to the data in a class and abstraction as applying to its public interface. The details of how the class functions is hidden from anything using the class. The calling code will know what the area property will give it, but it has no idea how it will be calculated. Okay, that's a bit about object-oriented programming with the jargon words like encapsulation, 
inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction. In this section, we will look at how all that applies to our code and how we use them when creating our classes. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity about object oriented programming principles and classes. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to start setting up the airport. By the end of this lecture, you will have a basic structure of the airport model set up on your local machine. So let's get started. As I mentioned in one of our last lectures that we are going to learn about object oriented programming and classes by modeling an airport. When designing your model, I would suggest you don't want to do what we are about to do. The first step should be to sit down with a pen and lots of paper and make notes about what your airport is going to look like or use a note taking program if you prefer. What you definitely shouldn't do is start off by trying to write the code for it all. Think really hard about your design. In programming job, you would probably do that as a part of the team, which is a great way to make sure you include everything you need. We can't do that in a video course, but I didn't want to give you an impression that you should start off by writing code. Okay, now I've got that out of the way, let's write some code. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to our project explorer and I'm going to right click and say, I'll create a new folder. I'll say airport model. Okay. And we are going to need quite a few classes to model our airport. And we saw some of them in our last lecture. Pretend that you have already done all the planning for this and let's go with my design. I'll explain some of the design decisions as we start to use the various classes. But for now, we'll just get them created. We are obviously going to need an airport class. So we will add a new file. Okay. And I'll say airport.js. All right. And here I'll create a class. I'll call this class as airport. It will be an empty class for now, which is fine. We are also going to need runways and terminals. In fact, we are going to need two classes for each. There will be a runways class that we are going to use to hold a collection of runway objects. Don't worry too much about that. I'll clear why I'm calling the runways with an S soon. For now, create two new classes, runways and airport terminals. Okay. So I'll add another file over here. I'll say airport terminals. Dot JS. And I'll say, remember that JavaScript lets you have more than one class in a single file. Some languages insist on one file per class but JavaScript doesn't have that restrictions. So I can say class airport terminal. And then I'll have one more class. So I'll just copy this and I'll call this airport terminal. This will be singular. I'll hit save. Now we'll do the same for runways. So I'll just duplicate this file and rename. I'll say runways.js and here I'll call this class as runways and this one as singular runway. I'll hit save. Okay, what else do we need? Well, 
there are going to be shops and restaurants in the terminals so we'll need a room class to represent the rooms they are in so i'll just add a room.js okay and i'll say class room here if you are wondering why we haven't called the rooms with an s like we did for terminals and runways don't worry we are going to work up to that when we do you will understand why we have got runways as well as runway all right so we have now created loads of classes and we have started modeling our airport so i'll end this lecture right now over here in this lecture we started modeling our airport with a few classes so we have created a few classes in our ide visual studio code so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class in this lecture we are going to discuss a little bit about class members in javascript classes by the end of this lecture you will have a clarity of what are the different class members that javascript classes have and what do they do we have already seen that classes can contain methods classes can contain other members as well in this course we are going to look at the members that are listed on the left of this slide we have already covered methods in some detail we have used methods extensively in our previous projects and we have also used some inbuilt methods in javascript we will still use them going forward although we added some fields to our classes we haven't discussed them in detail a field is a variable defined within the class if you need to refer to something in several methods of a class then a field is the way to do that a field stores the current state of a class its data different instances of a class will have different values for most if not all of the fields fields can also be available from outside the class however making fields public is generally frowned upon it breaks the principle of encapsulation you can mark them as private if you don't want to make them available publicly a constructor is a method that's called when an instance of a class is first created in a constructor you can initialize your fields and perform any other actions that are necessary for the class to work so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity on the different class members that exist in javascript classes I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about constructors and fields. So, we are going to work on our car game project right now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to close all of these files. and i'll switch over so i'll just collapse this airport model and i'll switch over to the car game folder and open main.js now here in our car game project we have the car class at the top here and this car class has a constructor over here this is a constructor method which defines the fields that we want for our every instance constructor method is also known as the constructor of the class car it is responsible for creating and initializing instance variables or fields 
when we create a new instance of the car class, so here, so when this statement is being executed, the constructor gets called and we can see this constructor being defined here. We use new keyword to create an instance like any other programming language like C sharp and Java. So this is a new keyword that I'm talking about. After that, the car, after that, the statement over here, like new car and in brackets, we have the Batmobile. This code looks just like a method call. It has got a single argument, the string Batmobile. We have to provide that argument because our car constructor at the top defines a string argument over here. Not string argument, but this is a string parameter over here. A constructor is a method with the name constructor over here and is automatically called when you create a new instance of the class. The value that's passed into the constructor is used to initialize the name field. Once the instance has been created, the name will be the Batmobile. And that's basically what a constructor is for. You define parameters for each of the fields that you want to initialize and assign values to the field inside the constructor. We could have passed value for speed as well inside the constructor. But instead we are initializing it with a default value over here within constructor itself. But if you already know the initial state and it's not being passed to the constructor, I would do it as we have here. All right. That's all what I have to say about the field and constructors at the moment. We will be creating constructors throughout the section. So you will get a plenty of practice at using them in your classes. If you want to see it being called, okay, what we can do is we can set a breakpoint over here. So let me scroll up and you can set a breakpoint on this particular line of code over here and you can try stepping into the cars constructor. In fact, let me show it to you. So what I will do is I will launch this with the live server and I will just expand this here and I'll say inspect and I'll say, so I'll say sources over here. I'll go to main.js and I'll scroll down and this is the line where we are creating the object. So I'll select this line and I'll set a breakpoint over here. All right. Now what I will be doing is I will simply refresh the page and you can see the debugger has stopped at line number 47 here. I'll zoom out a bit. So here you're seeing that Batmobile is undefined. All right. Now, if I say step into, you will be taken directly to the constructor over here. Okay. So if you press like step into one and two times, you will directly go into the constructor over here, as you can see, and you can see Batmobile is still undefined. So we will be executing this line over here then this line and both these variables within the instance variables, they are initialized and then the object is created. So I'll say step into once again. All right. And you can see this dot car speed is zero hash name is Batmobile. Okay. But this is not assigned yet to Batmobile and I'll say step into again. Okay. I'll just collapse this and Batmobile is still undefined. You say step into 
and you can see this line was executed here and if you scroll down you can see the object is now created and bat mobile has an object of car type okay and it has speed as zero and name is the bat mobile all right so this is how constructor works it works similar like in terms of flow it works similar to a method call but we have a new instance created along with the attributes initialized or field values initialized okay so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity about the constructors now whenever a constructor is executed we have instance variables created and they have their own copies of data attributes so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back in this lecture we are going to talk about getters and setters in javascript by the end of this lecture you will have a clarity as to how you can use getters and setters in javascript code and implement it in a real world program so let's get started we will continue with our car game project and if you check this project if i scroll down here within drive function we have been referring to speed directly over here now when you want to retrieve the value of a attribute okay or a data field you do so via a getter method similarly to change its value you will pass an argument to a setter method it's a useful feature and the one that you will use a lot to explain what it is i will refactor this code to do the things okay and what i will do is i will add a couple of functions so i'll zoom out a bit and here like just above accelerate method i'll create another method which is a get method and i'll say get speed all right and i'll say return this dot speed now this is a getter method which just returns the value of a instance attribute or instance property okay so this is the member of the class car and we are using this getter method to return the value of speed and you can see we are using the get keyword over here likewise you have a set keyword wherein you can create a setter okay you can say new value here and you can then say this dot speed is equal to new value all right so far so good i'll hit save now this does the same thing and makes it easier to understand what's happening easier but perhaps it's still confusing since we are using a method now okay we are accessing a class member which is name sorry which is speed using a method what we can do is we will have to add an underscore over here okay so so let me just zoom out and let me just move into the browser i'll just close this let me move to the console so if you see over here you are already getting this error okay uncaught range error maximum call stack exceeded all right now the moment you add an underscore over here so i add an underscore here all right and here as well and here as well and i hit save you see the error goes away all right 
Now I will just take it over here. I refresh. Let me accelerate. I say six. Batmobile is going at 60 miles per hour. You can see. Okay. Left, right, you can see. It's moving fine. All right. Now, what I will also do is I, I will scroll down. And here in draw road, I'll just comment this console.log because I don't want to have console.log right now. And instead I'll copy this console.log and I'll scroll up and I'll add to the getter here and I'll say get speed okay and I'll say set speed here so I'm just printing it on the console whenever we call getter method of speed and setter method of speed and I'll say accelerate I'll say by five or let me keep it four I'll say okay you can see we got get speed set speed and again get speed so what happened is when this was called in accelerate function so we pressed accelerate and we this function was called sorry this method was called so when this was accessed this wasn't accessed directly because now we have underscore speed so when this was accessed it was accessed via a getter okay so this returned the value of speed over here and then we incremented this by amount okay so getter was called okay and then we set the speed and that is why set was called and then to show the speed we had we accessed it once again. So to show the speed, we access it once again. All right. So this is how this worked. Okay. And getter and setter gives you some control as to who can access the value and you have a better control if you are allowing the access to this via a method. Now, the thing is, I'm just showing you how this works. So getter and setter works this way. Okay, whenever you try to update the speed class member or whenever you try to get the speed, okay, they will be accessed via this particular method. So for setting it will be via this and for getting it will be via this. But the question is, why would you want to do all of this? So we will see all of this a bit later about the why part. Okay. But behind the scenes, JavaScript uses methods to get and set the value of the fields. All right. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class super valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss why you should use getters and setters. And by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a complete clarity as to what is the significance or importance of getters and setters in JavaScript classes. So in the last lecture, we saw how getters setters work. What we haven't done is discussed or seen why we might want to add all that complexity into our code. After all, what I could do is I could just delete the getters and setters and everything would still work fine. So if I delete this here and if I just remove this from here, okay. And if I hit save, let me refresh. And you can see like it just works the same way. So why would we add the complexity? All right. So we can even do zigzag on the track. We can go straight and it works fine. Okay. So I'll tell you why. So we've got a problem with our code. So I'll just do control Z and undo everything we have. 
our speed can be accessed anywhere in the code and be updated okay so what i can do is i can i can just comment it again just a moment and i can just go down here in the accelerate function so here we have an accelerate function defined okay and here i can simply update the speed so i can say i'll just comment this and i can just say pat mobile dot speed is equal to So here in the accelerate method, what we are doing is speed is equal to speed, speed plus amount. So what I can do is here itself. So here I can say bat mobile dot speed is plus is equal to acceleration factor. So this can be done. All right. And now, so I've commented this previous line of code here, if you notice, and now if I accelerate, if I say seven, it's still going at 70 miles per hour, which means that the code still works, okay? So this tells us that speed can be updated from anywhere in our code. We have less control over it. And this is not a good model of a car. You don't dial in a speed and expect the car to suddenly travel at that speed. We need to prevent the calling code from changing the speed directly. Using getters and setters, that's easy. If we don't define a setter and make speed private, then nothing outside the class will be able to use it. Let me show this to you as well. All right, so if I scroll up here, if I enable the getters and setters here, and if I make this as, so I added an underscore, and I, if I make this as private, and if I hit save, okay, so private field must be declared, which is fine. So I'll just copy this. And I'll just add the declaration here and I'll hit save. Okay. Now if I try to accelerate six, okay, you can see, okay, we got an error. Bat mobile is going at any N miles per hour. Let me see. Okay. So if I scroll down here, I'll just comment this. So no commenting would help. So we are getting the bat mobile is going at any N miles per hour. And there is a reason for that. So if you go over here, we have changed the name of the speed property. So, but here in the getter and setter, we are referring it into the same way. Okay. So I'll just update this in occurrence and this as well and I shall hit save, okay? Now, the moment I hit save and I see accelerate six, okay, it says 60 miles per hour, okay? But if I scroll down, let's say, and here, let's say if I comment the setter out, all right? So, let me comment this and let me hit save. So it was working fine. Now I just commented it out and let me try to accelerate now. It should not work. Yes, so it gave me an error. It says cannot set property speed of car, which has only getter, all right? Now what this means is one, so it tells you one thing that we have speed, which is private and it cannot be accessed outside the class. Number two, we had a getter or setter to make it available publicly, but out of that, we commented the setter. So we removed the setter. So now this property has become read only and we are not able to set this, okay? Because there's no setter, all right? So 
this is what I was talking about. If we don't define a setter and make speed private, then you won't be able to update speed from outside the class. All right. This is good enough. And you are seeing an error message as well on the console. So we have prevented the calling code from messing with our speed. That's something you will often want to do in all sorts of situations. All right. So a code in a login form, for example, we need to read the user's password hash, but it certainly shouldn't be able to change it. Changing a password should only be possible after a successful login. So that's one reason for using a getter or a setter rather than allowing direct access to a field. We get more control over what can be done with it. In the earlier slides that I mentioned, I mentioned somewhere that you may want to validate the data. That's something we should do here. Our cars can accelerate up to and beyond light speed. If you could be bothered pressing accelerate long enough, remember that we are looking at a general programming technique over here. You may not be interested in writing games. And if I'm honest, this car game isn't the best, but the techniques apply to any kind of classes that you create in future. So let's see how we can prevent our cars from traveling at unrealistic speeds. So for that, I'll create a constant at the top over here. I'll say const and I'll say max speed. Okay. And I'll keep the max speed as 80. All right. Now you might think that the obvious place to check the speed is in accelerate method. That's the only way anything can change the speed of our car. That's true, but only at the moment. This is a basic car, very basic. It's top speed is 80 miles per hour. A bicycle can go faster than that in the right conditions. We may want to create a car with a turbo boost, which means we will add a turbo method. If we check the speed in accelerate, we would also have to perform the same check in the turbo method in future. Thinking about what we want to do, we want to restrict the range of our speed to be no greater than max speed. Where better to do that? than in the setter itself. All right. So setter would be the best place right now to check and validate the value of speed. So what I will do is I will uncomment these lines of code over here, which we had commented previously. There you go. And I'll add an if condition. So I'll say if new value is less than max speed. I'll add this bracket and I'll say speed. This dot speed is equal to new value. Fair enough. And else I'll say this dot speed is equal to max speed. And I'll comment this line of code over here. So what we are doing over here is we are checking if the new value of speed is less than max speed. If it is, we assign the new value to the speed. If it's not, then we are setting the maximum speed to max speed. So far, so good. Now the property is restricted and won't be greater than max speed. If it was appropriate, we could also include a test for a negative speed in here. I won't do that because we may want to equip our cars with a reverse gear. It's fine to prevent the brake from going backwards, but I don't want to take away the ability of a reverse gear to do that. But you are free to test any suitable conditions in your setter to make sure that your properties always have valid values. Let's see if this works. 
So I'll just hit save and I'll run the program. I'll add five to accelerate here. I'll say, okay. All right. So we got an error maximum call stack exceeded. So we are setting the speed a lot of times and let me see where we went wrong. So I'll just copy this. Okay, instead of directly saying speed, I'll just copy this and I'll add this over here because we were referring to speed directly and we can we inside the class, we can refer it this way. Okay, so I'll just hit save and I'll try to accelerate. I'll say five. Okay, so this works fine. Batmobile is going at 50 miles per hour. Okay, because we are reporting 10 times the speed. I got more to say about the show speed method because it really shouldn't be here. That's a design issue at the moment, but we are concentrating on properties right now. All right. So each time I press accelerate, okay, the car will keep on accelerating. I'll say seven, it goes to 120. Now let me press 10 or let me press 14. It goes to 260. Now I'll directly say 70. Okay, I'll just go a little bit off and you will see that the limit is now 800 miles per hour and it won't go any faster. So if I try to accelerate again, it will stick to 800 miles per hour, which is really good. And it tells us that our car has hit a maximum speed and the score is working fine. So that's two reasons for using getters and setters rather than allowing direct access to your properties. Doing that is consistent with the principles of encapsulation and abstraction. Our speed is encapsulated and not exposed to the outside world. Abstraction requires the inner workings of the class to be hidden from anything using it. And in the next few videos, we will take a look at other things as to what we can do with our car class. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. And hopefully this helped you understand the importance of getters and setters. So I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the single responsibility principle. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a understanding of this topic. And along with me, you will also be refactoring our car game so that it adheres to this principle. So let's get started. So one advantage of abstraction is that we are free to change the way our class implements thing without causing problems for the code that uses our classes. As an example, many modern digital speedometers in cars and motorbikes can be switched from displaying kilometers per hour to show miles per hour. At least they can in Europe. It's probably not that useful feature in large land masses such as Asia, America or Australia. Our car class is currently working in miles per hour and anything that uses it will be used to getting those units. If we suddenly change the class to work in kilometers, we could break a lot of existing code. Okay, I know that we haven't got anything else using this class, but we are looking at a bigger picture here. There will come a time when you will create a class that's being used in lots of programs. When that happens, the API or the application programming interface that your class exposes to the outside world is a sort of contract. If you go changing the interface in unexpected ways, all those programs will stop functioning correctly. You can add to the API 
by including new methods and properties but you can't take anything away from it nor you can go changing the behavior of your properties in unexpected ways a speed property reports miles per hour and has to continue to do so what we can do is allow the calling program to specify the units if it requests kilometer per hour then that's fine the programmer will have chosen to do that and will write the rest of their code accordingly we will default to returning miles per hour because that's what the class currently does anything that's already using it will continue to work with no problems at least not problems that we have caused before we do that there are two things that i wanted to discuss briefly the first is the single responsibility principle single responsibility is one of the five solid principles of object oriented programming i'm not going to talk about them in detail because this is a course about coding and not design but it's worth reading more on those five principles wikipedia has an introductory article with links and you can see the link that i have loaded over here in the browser so here you can read a bit more about this principle right now our car class violates the single responsibility principle because it's displaying the speed we shouldn't be doing that if we try to use the class in a gui program or a graphical program such as an arcade game it wouldn't work with self drive cars taking off our code could be used by tesla or google in one of their cars we don't know whether they'll fit an analog speedometer or a digital one in fact they may not have sort of console they may just broadcast the speed to nearby vehicles by violating the single responsibility principle we have prevented our class from being used in other applications our car should report its speed when asked but shouldn't make assumption about how the speed will be displayed to fix that i will switch over to my ide here and i'll delete the show speed method over here or i'll at least comment it over here now if i hit save and if i click on info you will get an error that show speed is not a function fair enough you will also have to comment these lines okay where we are calling show speed so i'll comment these okay here now if you scroll down where we are requesting the show speed here we can add an alert over here so what i will do is i'll scroll up i'll copy this alert here okay and here down here i'll add this alert over here okay now if you run the program or at least we have started seeing some errors here okay so you can see over here this dot name so this won't be this but instead this will be batmobile dot name okay so we don't have a name or access to name over here okay so if we say name let me see what happens or let me show you what happens it should say undefined all right in the output but i'll i've just written batmobile dot name and batmobile dot speed all right i change this and now i'll hit save and i'll say accelerate 5 i say show me the speed and it says undefined is going at 50 miles per hour 
Now we are getting undefined because name is not exposed yet. This name is not exposed. So if you scroll up, name is private. How do I expose this? So I'll have to expose this by adding a getter. So I'll add an underscore here and I'll copy this. I'll paste it here. Okay. And then I'll add a getter over here. So I'll say get. So not here, but instead I'll, I'll just add it at the top here. Yeah. So I'll say get name. And I'll say return this dot hash name. All right, I'll hit save. And now if you say info, you will see Pat Mobile is going at zero miles per hour. So this works perfectly fine now. All right. And what we have done is we have removed or we have removed the assumption as to how the speed will be displayed. All right. And this is in lines with the single responsibility principle or solid principle that we discussed. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys had fun refactoring the car game. And I hope you guys found this lecture valuable and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Congratulations on reaching the end of this course. I'm Tim Bachalka from the Learn Programming Academy and the Learn Programming Academy is the publisher of this course. So this quick video is designed to get some free and valuable development information into your hands today. You know, when I was studying way back in the 1980s, which I know was a long time ago, it was hard to succeed as a programmer. Uh, there was no internet for starters, but also other than books or universities or colleges, there really was no way to uh, basically talk to anyone or get access to the information you needed to succeed. So you were largely on your own in other words. So I wanted to change all that and give you all the tools and information you need to succeed. And as such, I'm trying to pass on my wisdom and experience to make your goals of becoming a programmer or getting a better programming job, uh, make that goal a reality for you. So I'm gonna promise you here, here and now, that the information that uh, I put together is really useful to you as a developer and it will make a difference. So let me explain the information I'm giving away to you free today. So firstly, I'm giving a free access to my Learn to Code course. And uh, in this course, it's different to the courses that I've been uh, producing on Udemy because it's designed to help you understand how programming works, but how computers work under the hood. So we're talking right down to circuits and switches, how the hardware works, but also how uh, computers talk in only one language, binary and machine code, things like that nature, which you don't normally learn in a particular course. So all of this though is designed to teach you the information you need as from a perspective of a programmer. So it's going to help you and make you a better programmer long term. That's the sole aim of that course. So you'll get access to that free. Next, I'm going to give you free access again to my programmer's guide in ebook format. Now that also has over 100 related videos, which you'll get access to well, as, if I can get it out, access to as well on all aspects of your programming career. So the ebook and videos collectively answer pretty well all the important questions, certainly the majority of them, uh, relating to uh, basically programming careers. And uh, some of the sample questions that it actually answers is, uh, how long does it take to become a developer? Whether you need a degree to make it as a developer? What's the number one skill you need to have to succeed as a programmer? You know, are you too old to become a developer? And one other one, uh, do you need to be good at math to succeed as a programmer? But there's a ton more, over 100 as I mentioned. I think there's 106 videos as of the date that I'm recording this video. And you'll get all of those, the answers to those questions. And look, I even take requests for future videos. So if you've got a particular question and it's not answered in the over 100 that I've already answered, send me a message and I'll actually do a video on that as well. So basically anything you need to know about your programming career is answered in the uh, ebook and also the related videos. What else? You still want more? Didn't I say this is all free anyway? I'm selling something that's for free anyway. But uh, look, seriously though, I'll also give you access to my programmer's career paths ebook. Now this is something that uh, is really important because it shows you the exact courses that you need to study to achieve your career goals. So in other words, uh, as an example, do you want to be a web developer? I'll give you the lowdown on the specific courses you need to become a web developer. Do you want to say, right, cross-platform apps for mobile apps for iOS and Android? Study these courses. Again, I'll go through those particular courses. Perhaps you want to get into the Java enterprise space. 
you want to do that, study these courses. So on and so forth. So I'm putting the finishing touches now to that guide and uh, depending when you're watching this video, it may already be available, but if not, uh, it won't be far away. Either case, you'll be getting that access to that particular ebook for free as well. All right, and lastly, because I know this video is dragging on a bit, the Learn Programming Academy's channel has 40 other courses here on Udemy. So I'm gonna give you the information, a bit of a summary on what each of those courses are all about, but also with a big discount link to get them at the best price possible as well. So what's the catch here? How much to pay? <laughs> Seriously though, I'm not really a salesman. No catch, it's 100% free. All right, so how do, do you access this material? Well, download the ebook that's right in this lecture that you're watching right now. Just click on the resources that you can see on screen now on this particular lecture and uh, click on the bonus PDF, which you can see there. Open it up and it's got everything you need to access all the information that I've talked about here today. So thanks for watching and uh, you may find you need to be logged on to a computer to get the ebook because it may or may not show up if you're on a mobile device. So if you don't see it showing up when you're clicking on resources or in fact resources doesn't show up, log into a computer and you should have access to that and just click it as I said, open it up and the information's in that PDF. But uh, if you do get stuck, drop me a message on Udemy and uh, I'll get back to you and make sure that you do actually get the uh, access to that PDF today. All right, so get to it, download the ebook right now while you remember. And uh, thanks again for watching and I look forward to hearing about your future success.